what uh I want to be Fergie. You, Tristana isn't Fergie. I'm Fergie. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Chase, we're live. We got our boy, Chase. We got... What's up, Chase? We got the rest of the team in the house. Some people, at least. And we got some haters. Uh Uh-oh. We got some haters saying that we're heretical dogs. I don't know who uses like they think they're writing some kind of 17th century manuscript from Geneva to try to refute <laughs> orthodoxy, the heretical dogs. Nobody actually talks that way unless they're like a 20 year old who just started reading the Bible or something like that. So uh, we're going to, I guess, bring these people in pretty soon. But as you guys know, it is uh, open forum today. We'll be taking questions, Q&A. Welcome, everybody. We'll get precedent to the super chat questions. And we'll get precedent to whoever wants to come on and debate. Of course, you have to follow the rules. You can't come on and act like a a total tard. You can't come on and spurg out or you immediately get banned. So if you follow the rules, you're welcome to come debate. There are qualifications. You have to follow the rules. So uh, we will take Super Chats. We'll take questions from the Discord. Uh, for those that don't know, we have a Discord with right at, we're right shy of 7,000. So we are almost to 7,000 in the largest server for Orthodox Christianity, the Discord server. I'll give you guys that link here in a moment and also a little preliminary. So today's stream is going to be just kind of uh, open forum. We've done this many times. We'll also have an edgier, woo, edgier stream getting a little hot tonight over on Rockfin. So remember to go over to The Rock. Yes, we're going to be touching on hot topics, things that hurt the soft souls and hearts over on YouTube. So we got to go over to Rockfin if we want to talk about real issues. No no soft stuff over here. Excuse me, only soft stuff over here. Uh, Let me get the Discord link for you guys, those of you who want to come in. Uh, Yes, there is a vetting process of people take issue with this i mean what of course we're gonna have a betting process i think we're gonna let all the goobers into our discord no it's in fact a 99.9 percent goober free discord although we do sometimes have goobers that slide in goobers sliding into our dms on the discord and they immediately get purged it's like a straight up stalinist discord baby we're straight up soviet kgb yes you got it And I've been outed as a Soviet KGB spy many, many times over. Hence why we run the Discord with such an iron fist. And my head of Cheka, Soviet intelligence operations, internal police, Chase Haggard is with us today. You know him as the lovely sister of the lovely Tristana. 
from Internet East Celebrity fame. And he's going to be helping out to feel with the questions. Uh, and we did some, we had some haters. We had some people in the comments saying they're going to come on and set us straight. As you know, we give uh, opposing position the floor. We let them come on and make whatever arguments they want. This is typically how our Discord functions. Uh, you're welcome to come in. You can have as long as you want within reason. No, you can't ramble for uh, the next two hours. You're welcome to present whatever arguments you want. And uh, I think there's two Protestants, one or two Protestants. They had to team up, apparently. Two Protestants who want to come on and set us straight. Our, our Protestant friends, Corn, Corn. Corn is going to set us straight as well as some dude named Bantu. Now we have a based Bantu on the Discord. This is a different Bantu. So Yeah, not related. Not, not related. related. Different Bantus. Uh, Chase, are you going to bring those clown towns in? Yes, I am predestining them to come into the VC right now by vetting them in. Now, and, uh, <laughs> they may or may not be Calvinists. I don't know because I went over on... Uh, post uh, B grade post Malone, I mean vocab Malone's uh, channel, and I was like, "Any of you people talking, you're welcome to come over to the channel." So that may be where they came from. I don't know. Yeah, let's see. Hopefully, they'll be in here soon. Um, they've been waiting for a while. They were kind of annoyed they had to wait, but uh, well, sorry, they should dude. Be in here soon. We we run a straight up Gulag Soviet Discord, so you don't just get in here. Yes. You have the to be, Dugan dollars do, do pay for You got to be loyal to the party. You got to be loyal to Dugan. You got to swear your oaths to Lord Dugan. Then you get in. Do you swear oath to Lord Dugan? Do you promise to always... Here. Yeah. Bantu, are you there? Yeah. Awesome. Yes, we're here. All right. Well, as you know, uh, we give you guys the floor uh, in my Discord. So you're welcome to have as long as you want. Present whatever arguments you want. And then I will respond. So go for yeah. it. Why are we? You said we're heretical dogs. Why is that? You hold to the east and heterodox positions. Uh, I mean, I don't believe that you actually know what the eastern heterodox positions are. So feel free to outline that. They're the wicked teachings of Satan, of course. Okay, this sounds like. A, are you trolling? No, no, no. Are you going to actually make an argument, or are you just going to say that it's the wicked teacher? What are you even talking about? Hmm? What was that? That's not an argument. Do you know how to present an argument? Calling it a position, the wicked teaching of Satan, is not an argument. Uh, I thought you were asking what my thoughts on the East and North thoughts. Yeah, well, uh, you're here to present an argument, are you not? Yeah, of course. What's the argument? Bantu has it ready. Oh, you can't do it. Your buddy has to do it. Okay. Get ready. Hold on to your butts. Hold on to your butts. All right. Yo, sorry. <clears throat> I had to deal with something. Okay. So, uh... I'm you had going, to deal with I'm what? Sure Go Go what? Googling really fast? No, no, no. Being based. I don't think you're based. I don't think you know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, it's very sad. Okay. Well, I see that the Orthodox Church has forgotten underwent uh, doctrinal developments over the years, uh, specifically when it comes to icons and the dormition of Mary. Nope, no. Um, in the er that's uh, false. Yeah, yeah. In the early, nope, in the early church, we find... Uh, no, that's true. It's they false. don't find anything mentioning the dormition of Mary. And the only mention of it comes from an apocryphal gospel, uh, as well as the icons. Many of the early church fathers uh, could be seen as iconoclasts as well. No, they weren't. There's one pseudepigraphical work by Epiphanius. That's it. And by the way, all the principles behind iconography are present in the 1st, 2nd, and 3rd century. Have you, are you aware of the Duro Europa Synagogue? Uh, are you aware of the... Uh, are you aware of the Duro Europa Synagogue? Are you aware of the... Okay, you're not going to answer my question with another question. Are okay, you aware sure, of it or not? I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware. Okay. I'm not aware of it. Right, so that is the 1st, 2nd century uh, excavation that shows that the early synagogue worship included iconography. So the idea that Judaism is iconoclastic is actually false. Judaism itself includes the principles of iconography. Okay, but you see, you know what? You have heard of the country of Spain, right? And in Spain, there's a certain region now. In no, I've never heard of the country of Spain. What, what is Spain? Well, you see, Spain is this country in the Mediterranean. Now, see, in the second century, they had a council, a council of Elvira, and the canon 36 of said council declared that any pictures are to be forbidden in the church. 
Yeah, but uh, I, I I doubt that. But even if that is the case, we don't follow every well, like local. Said, we don't follow every local. We don't follow it. every local canon, nor do you, nor does anybody follow every single local synod. By the way, Toledo is the first uh, tr- uh, canon to synod in Spain to introduce the filioque. So uh, I'm not sure how that's relevant or what that actually proves. I mean, if, well, if, yeah, if, if we if we thought the consensus of the uh, church fathers, among not a, the, one, a local a local council in Spain is not the consensus of the church fathers. And by the way, if you read the rest of the church fathers of the first, second, and third century, you'll see that they taught that there's a liturgical worship, that there's relics, and that there's the real presence in the Eucharist. All of those early church fathers taught that. That's the principle. You have, you have people like Clement of Alexandria also contesting said view of the Eucharist. Again, the consensus of the Cyril is a heretic. He's not a saint. He's not one of our Life church based. fathers. He's not one of our church fathers. So you you have no idea what you're talking about. Clement is not in the list of canonical church fathers for the Orthodox Church. We consider him a heretic because he taught anti-trinitarian uh, doctrines. No, I think you're talking out of your ass, mate. No, it's Clement taught that no, the. You're you're a, you're a blasphemous I, dog. You are, uh, uh, yeah, so you lost. You're done. You you're, you're lost. You're done. This, well, look at this guy. He's total I idiot. This guy has no I idea what he's talking about. No, so you just reserve all, all you had. That's all, that's all you had. You got refuted. You don't even know what Clement taught. Clement taught an anti-Trinitarian doctrine, and that's why he's not accepted in the Orthodox Church. So really, it doesn't matter what Clement says. It doesn't matter what Origen says. It doesn't matter what a heretical local council says. Bro, you have a son and rat in your profile picture. What the hell is wrong with you? This is not a serious if, person. This does. This person has no idea what he's debate, talking about. If you want to actually present an argument, or just say you're a heretical dog and I'm based. That's not an argument. No. If you want to actually unite someone, it's not an argument either. No, it is when he starts yeah, resulting to the you're a heretical dog. That's because he doesn't have an answer. He doesn't know what Clement taught. Uh, I just finished a PhD dissertation on Clement. It's right here. Basil of Caesarea, there's a whole chapter on what Clement of Alexandria taught and why he's not accepted in the Orthodox Church as a church father. But Vladimir Lasky has a whole book on it, the image and likeness. So that's two scholars from our church from the modern day who have shown and explained why Clement is not a saint in our church. So do you want to cite any other heretics that we don't accept, like Tertullian? Is that going to be another argument for you? People like Athenagoras of Athens, Eusebius of Caesarea. Yep. So again, you keep Europe. citing heretics who are not saints. So why are you citing why are you citing semi Arians? Do you accept Epiphanius as a saint? So uh, there's dispute over whether that one text of Epiphanius on icons is pseudepigraphical. Did you even know that? Yes, I know. Okay. So and it doesn't matter if one saint is wrong about something. Do you accept everything that Basil taught? Do you accept everything that Athanasius taught? Citing one, so citing one church father literally proves nothing, and nobody in any church follows one church father on every single thing. So the principle. Well, I cited multiple. I'm not citing one monkey. You're citing, dude. Don't call me a monkey. Just get him out of here. He can't. He can't debate. Just boot this oh. guy. Yeah, all he has is name. No, all you have is name. Calling. You can't make an. No, dude. You're just calling people monkeys. All that does is show the idiocy of Protestantism. This is all you guys have. Is nothing. You guys have nothing. Corn, do you want to try to present an argument, or do you just want to call us no. monkey? Here, I'm going to... These are 18-year-olds who don't know argument. anything about... They just Googled some article talking from some Calvinist website about why icons are wrong. I mean, I'd be glad to go into an actual biblical argument for iconography, which is all through Scripture, by the way. Here, Corn, I'm going to unmute you, and if you don't have an argument, that's okay. But if yeah, as soon as you call people free, names, you're dogs, and monkeys, you're out of here. You're unmuted. Well, we would like to at least say that we wish you were pen of your heresy. All right, just get him out of here. He doesn't have an argument. Yeah, so yeah, you guys you have nothing. Need you're need actually you're, you're actually the heretics because you don't have a Bible apart from the Orthodox Church, right? It's the Church Fathers that gave you the Bible. You don't even know how to interpret the text that you're misinterpreting. And your spotty quote mining of heterodox Church Fathers proves absolutely nothing. Literally, you didn't you didn't cite a single church father that's accepted except Epiphanius, and Epiphanius's treatise on questioning icons is doubted in terms of its authenticity, famously. So again, no arguments whatsoever. He didn't even know what the Dura Europa Synagogue was, a famous classic proof text that Judaism is not iconoclastic. And this is what Calvinists and Protestants refer to as one of their key texts: is that oh, Judaism, you see, the original Ten Commandments was iconoclastic. 
Uh, no, on the contrary. We've shown that in many videos, many debates, many disputes. It was not iconoclastic. It was, in fact, iconodual. You have, uh, for example, at the dedication of the temple, Solomon praying, the glory cloud coming down, and everyone prostrating before the ark and before the temple. Literally prostrating, venerating, right? We have Joseph venerating even Pharaoh. He bows before Pharaoh because Pharaoh was the ordained authority, even in God's providence, even as an evil leader. So if evil leaders can still be given reverential deference, so can good things from God, right? The saints. The saints are the very life and body of Christ on earth. That's why there's relics. That's why cloths from Paul's body go out and heal people in the book of Acts. That's why the bones of Elisha heal people in the books of the Kings is because relics is a biblical principle. And the same principle behind the real presence is the same principle behind relics is the same principle behind icons. So you are a Nestorian, iconoclastic, platonic heretic. And it's you that is out of accord with the entire tradition of the church, despite your three or four sources from heterodox people in the early church. Uh, anyway, so let's move on. Do we have any other people who want to speak? Well, that Bunty is, is, is an imposter. Don't worry about that. Yeah, we knew that. That's the real Bantu. That was the fake Bantu. That was the 16-year-old who has just read his first blog post. Bizarro Bantu. So it's open forum. Nobody has to wait for me. Um, so we have we answer, to ask a question. Uh, you don't have to ask permission. You can ask. Okay, I was just wondering that does the idea of um, Godel's incompleteness theorem or Russell's paradox pose any sort of uh, problem to the idea that mathematics is discovered versus invented or that it can be justified under any sort of system? If so, how do orthodox like account for those types of things and does it um does it pose so much any sort of problem for like the consistency of mathematics as we understand it no i mean i think i've appealed multiple times to the incompleteness theorems as a, a, a mathematical version of a transcendental type of argument it's the same form the same pattern you see this in uh hofstadter's book gerdell escher bach where he shows that Gerdell's incompleteness theorem is not something that's restricted to mathematics or set theory. It's also something applicable to many areas of life. And so I don't know if you're new to my type of argumentation and apologetic and the approach that we have here, but uh, I've, invi I've often argued the opposite, that it has uh, everything to do with vindicating paradigms, how paradigms work in terms of philosophy. Um, and so, no, it's not a problem. Why would it be a problem? Why would it be a problem? By the way, uh, uh, for those in the chat, um, I did write an essay 10 years ago uh, defending the biblical uh, argument for uh, iconography. And it's all obviously connected to the correct doctrine of the incarnation. Uh, no Protestant has a correct doctrine of the incarnation. They're all Nestorian or anti-Trinitarian in the implications of their uh, Christological doctrines. And so as you can see, there's a direct connection there. So where are you at, dude? Did you leave? What's up? He was muted. He had a hot mic, you're unmuted. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, well, I don't understand your argument. What is it? How does this relate to orthodoxy? How is this a problem for math? I don't get it. Well, if we're trying to make transcendental uh, arguments using logic and uh, mathematics, then don't we rely on some form of consistency in order for it to prove our argument in the first place? Like logic has to have some sort of um, connection to the world if we're going to even make the argument of the transcendental yeah, argument. Sure. And if it's actually incomplete, if it doesn't describe the world, right. then it can't be said to be valid. Sure. Yeah. That's included in the argument for God's existence. Yes. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you. Right, for that. So a transcendental argument is not the same thing as the transcendental argument for God's existence. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. So yes, the uh, assumption that logic works in the world is one of the several assumptions that would be involved in a transcendental argument for God. I'm also curious on 
like if you were to define logic, logic is a pretty broad thing and you use it kind of vaguely in transcendental argument. How would you define logic precisely? Because there's like syllogistic logic, categorical logic, and so forth. Uh, well, and I'm specifically referring to the doctrine of the logi. So this would be the question, the meta logical question. So the question, uh, not of different types of logic, but what is logic itself? And so that's what we're talking about. Like the essence of logic. Meta logic. What is the ontological status of logical entities, propositions, abstract concepts, and universals, etc.? Okay. Okay. That's what my, that's all my question was. Thank you. No problem. Anytime. Hey, Jay, uh, question here. Sure. Uh, this is in regards to Father uh, Stephen DeYoung and his recent work, uh, The Religion of the Apostles. Okay. Um, in this work of his, uh, which on, on, on the surface, uh, very good, you know, um, beginner level book for Protestant convert, converts to see the continuity of Israel into the church, you know, great stuff there, but some things there's been some things in it that i've been you know questioning and i i think this is just common with uh father stevens um uh i guess perception of the scriptures but it's his understanding that um the entirety of of ancient israel what constituted israel was not so much um you know a a, a descend uh Having, having that common ancestor of Jacob, right, that there was an Israelite ethnic um, identity, right, and that he, he, he is um, positing that what made Israel was just the ideas or just the faith of Israel and that there was no ethnic ties to it that, you know, we even had, like, black uh, high priests and all, all these things, like, what... What is what is your understanding on on the what made someone an Israel right Israelite because we had proselyte, proselytes right that um, would be received by by Israelites uh, we see that in the in the New Testament of course but what what would you say uh, properly made up Israel. Well, I, I've not read his book. I know that we've had uh, Lewis from the Discord did an interview with uh, Father Stephen the Young on that that book. So I heard a little bit of that uh, interview. I didn't hear the full thing. So I can't comment uh, in terms of his arguments, but in terms of what you've said or presented as his argument, I would disagree that there is not an emphasis on the uh, genealogical component. Obviously, there is, given the fact that the uh, priesthood was Levitical, the priesthood the priesthood was the sons of Aaron. Israel is called right after in terms of the, the 12 tribes so that there's not a, a genealogical component to this again, I think would, would uh, maybe he's just trying to de-emphasize the gene. So I don't know. Uh, it is clearly the case that in the old Testament, you do have um, con uh, people who were uh, converts. Even then you had people that, for example, left, uh, Egypt with the Jews who had pre uh, presumably converted. You had when Joseph was in Egypt, he made converts. Um, and a lot of those uh, Old Testament examples of that kind of stuff for us, they pre-signify the bringing in of the Gentiles in the New Testament. So there's indicators even in the Old Testament of Gentiles coming in, but that is not enough to say that it wasn't uh, essentially a uh, largely a genetic component. So the, the idea is that Abraham's descendants in terms of genealogy are going to be the ones that are both the spiritual and the literal physical um, beholders of the promise, right? And that's what Paul says in Romans is that to the sons of Israel were the covenant, the law, the promises, right? So that it was not to this genealogical, uh, it's not ex totally exclusive in the Old Testament period, but it's largely exclusive is the way I would phrase it. And then in the New Testament, we have the, the, the breaking down of that exclusion, right? And I mean, how, why would how, Paul's arguments in Galatians wouldn't even make sense if there wasn't that wall of separation and exclusion. That's Paul's whole argument in Galatians is that now in Christ, that wall of separation and exclusion has been removed through baptism. So circumcision is fulfilled in the rite of baptism. It was my understanding that he was trying to differentiate all of the tribes of Israel from just the descendants of Judah. You know, that Abraham was the father of many nations. He was saying that the, the term Hebrew and Jew and uh, all this gets conflated. This was my understanding. 
Because he was saying, like, Paul with a Benjamin I, you know. So it yeah, wasn't that, just that one tribe or whatever. Uh, that, that's kind of a separate component to what he was talking about. I, I think he was addressing the fact that we often just say the Jews when when uh, just the tribe of Judah was one element of Israel. And that, that was kind of a separate thing. But um, but thanks, Jay. Uh, just, uh, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I think um, I don't think anyone's ever addressed him on this. So, um, Mm. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd have to read the book. I, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not accusing you of misunderstanding, but uh, um, yeah, I think it's pretty obvious that the genetic component is obvious. It's clearly stressed, you know, throughout, you know, the post uh, Abrahamic covenant. So, uh, thanks. Joseph, uh, Joseph, if I'm not wrong, there's uh, on his podcast, the whole Council of God. I think when he was doing an introduction to uh, Galatians, I mean, he delved a bit into uh, the ethnos aspect. And from what I understand, he talked about, he didn't say like it's not, like he said it's uh, something else. But I, I think you should listen to what he has to say. I think he delves into, you know, the differences between like Jew and Gentile more there on that talk. All right, thank you. No, no those are great questions. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I wish I'd read the book, then I'd be, I'd be more, you know, apt to speak on it, but I'm so mired in all these other books that I'm working on to finish my book, which was just a nightmare. It's just taking forever that I got to get through this first. I'm almost done with it. It's taking forever just because it's a really slow <laughs> read, but, uh, so if you want like half of a book on cat epinoia, so anyway, um, the reason it's horrible audio is because it's in Discord. So it's live on Discord and not everybody has the best mic in Discord. So um, so uh, go whine somewhere else, Philip. Welcome, everybody. This is Open Forum. Uh, we had a couple people from Clown Town that ended up getting booted. Hope you missed. Hope you saw that. Uh, it was entertaining. We're always happy to have the Lowell Cows come on and entertain us. Uh, what's up? Open Forum. Who's up? Bring it. I have a question to ask. Okay. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Who would like to go? Which one of us? Go ahead, man. Okay, thank you. Um, Jay, I was reading part of your book on esoteric Hollywood, and it, it, it's an interesting point. I, I wanted you to help me figure this out here, where um, it, you, you would think that with satanic rituals and stuff like that, that would seem almost like an anti-authority thing, you know, attacking, uh, you know, Christian ethics and what so would seem like an anti-establishment move, but you kind of show how the the forces behind it in a certain sense are actually kind of from certain establishment things that are contention. Like the good example is Aleister Crowley being allegedly an MI5 agent and what have you, and this ultimately being popular among, uh, you know, political and academic elites. But one thing that kind of, that, that was interesting then to kind of look on the other side of was in your chapter on The Shining, Stanley Kubrick being kind of anti-American, anti-American imperialist mm -hmm. in his like foreign policy commentary. So if, if Kubrick is almost kind of this agent of the American establishment and the American government, why would he be anti-American uh, foreign policy? Well, because even within America, there's been different uh, factions and different attitudes. And during the Cold War, a lot of people bought into the um, the dialectic of East versus West. And so obviously Hollywood was full of people who believe Marxism, right? I mean, you have Dal uh, Dalton Trumbo, you have the, uh, the 10 people, Humphrey Bogart, and all these people that were sort of hauled in uh, as, as the, the suspicious, the 10 people, the 10 Reds in Hollywood or whatever that was called during the McCarthy time. Um, you had Kubrick pretty much seeming to adopt Marxism in uh, Spartacus. I mean, kind of the whole attitude of Spartacus is is this, the revolt of the lower or a slave class against the elites. Uh, so I would say that that remember that during the Cold War, especially, not everybody understood dialectic. So a lot of people really genuinely bought into, oh, America's good. Uh, the East is bad or the East is good. America is bad. Now, obviously I'm not pro communist. Uh, there's a lot of horrible things about communism, but as we're learning nowadays, there's a lot of horrible things about uh, monopolistic capitalism, right? They both are atheistic materialistic philosophies and the higher level people like 
uh, a Marx or like an H.G. Wells were cognizant of, of that. They would actually say that, you know, at the top, right, we really don't care about um, perfect socialism and perfect capital or fighting capitalism. Capitalism, H.G. Wells said, can actually build the infrastructure of the global government that the socialists will then take over. So um, I would just say that there's different levels and not everybody understands the highest levels. That's why during the Cold War, there's a very few limited number of people like uh, Victor Rothschild, like uh, Robert Maxwell, like these, these famous kind of spy, super rich figures who would play both sides. They understood there was a, a higher level di dialectic at work, working towards a global government, working towards a third way. People like Alger Hiss, people at the CFR, uh, back during the Cold War, we're, we're beginning to say we need to combine Western capitalism with Eastern Sovietism. So the, the answer is that both of those systems uh, lead towards technocracy, but not everybody in the Cold War understood that. So I don't think that, Colt, that Kubrick knew everything about geopolitics. And he probably thought, you know, the way to fight the system is to, you know, uh, be anti-war, to be uh, anti-U.S. imperialism, etc. Does that make sense? Yep, that's a great answer. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, we can talk about whatever. We don't have to talk about uh, theology. Uh, I'll be doing, by the way, I forgot. So uh, later on, an edgier stream because we have uh, unearthed multiple people, researchers have unearthed this uh, UK uh, think tank document about uh, human modification. Uh, that's going to be re very relevant. I'm going to be covering that tonight on the Rockfin stream. So that's probably a little too edgy for the soft hearts over here on YouTube. Uh, Sergeant Pepper's Soft Hearts Club over here on YouTube. We'll be going to Rockfin later to cover that. Uh, as well as, did you guys see Black Widow? Uh, hello. Speaking of Victor Rothschild, speaking of the Soviets, speaking of the illegals program, did you notice that? Hello. Black Widow at the very beginning. It's the director S Soviet illegals program, just like in the Americans. Did you notice? It's all right there in the movie. She's human trafficked. And she sold into this monarch mind control program. That's crazy. I did not expect that. Uh, and really the only reason I went to see that, and I don't really care for these Mar Marvel movies, obviously, but I went to see it because it was about uh, mind controlled assassins. And we'll be doing an up upcoming uh, stream on femme fatale mind control chicks. All right. What's, what's up? Who's next? Uh, I had a question, but there was another guy... Uh before that's fine go ahead whoever Man, it's hot up in here it's hot it's getting hot in here so take off all your clothes all right the other guy doesn't seem to be here anymore so i'll ask my okay, question go ahead it's actually also on uh, movies i read your article about uh, cruella and you talk about uh, uh, the what I, as far as i understand these happenings in the uh, fashion industry uh, how if I understand it correctly, boomers, they uh, <laughs> violated their kids or this uh, MK Ultra. Uh, but, my, but my question is, because okay, so the Cruella, the movie, it's got all these elements in the film. Right. Uh, but uh, what's your fear? Why did, uh, why did the director or, yeah, why did he or she put it in the movie? Was it to warn about this or was there some other purpose? No, I mean, this is, again, just a principle of psychological warfare similar to gaslighting. If you know what people do in relationships on a, on a micro scale, they yeah, gaslight yeah. people. So, I mean, it's just a classic form of uh, uh, hiding things in plain sight when it comes to psychological warfare. So, no, they're not. Disney is not warning you about uh, what's going on. They think that it's just another way to kind of um, condition you and uh, dispel, you know, because most normies, most people, you know, they, they see a hundred different instances of this in, in movies and film, right? And so they're just conditioned to it, right? So then, oh, that was in a movie. You're talking about movie stuff, right? Even though there's like, you know, dozens of uh, books that you could read about the, you know, the reality, the history of the MKUltra programs, which was many, many programs, which evolved into uh, DARPA, which evolved into... Fort Dietrich and uh, human augment augmentation and uh, transhumanism, which we'll be covering later tonight on Rockfin. Even though that's all you could, in five minutes, you could Google and find out if that's the case, uh, people, they, they, they just can't handle it. They can't figure that out. So uh, people don't realize how sophisticated uh, psychological warfare is. It's a science. It's, it's extremely sophisticated. 
and people that make uh, movies, the heads of these uh, big corporations, they all come out of wartime intelligence. I mean, we've shown that, I don't know how many times, I've, I've done a, two books on it, I've mentioned it probably a hundred times in interviews, probably a hundred times in my own podcasts. I mean, it's not accidental that the heads of the OSS, uh, the, the heads of the major networks are all out of the OSS. All right. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. Sure. All right. Uh, there is the Streamlabs. If you want to answer or ask questions on Streamlabs, we got a few here. Uh, Jay Deal the Real says, "How does one catch up in?" this cult catch up in this cult j deal the real trying to be a bishop someday oh <laughs> i guess he's making a joke that he's going to be an orthodox bishop uh seriously though how can i remotely catch up i don't know what you mean bro catch up on what the theology or or uh, catch up on your sick rhymes you'll you will never catch me on my rhyme skills so literally no one in the world can out battle rap me. And we saw that with Tristana, right? We saw Tristana basically retiring from the rap game within a few months. Yeah, that was actually, I, I just got to point out that um, well, we're not technically related anymore. My parents did do a soft disowning. It was loving, but it was a, a legal and binding disowning of him. Well, in our familial relations after that happened. So I, we thank you for that, Jay. You exposed the weakness. We remove the weakness from our family. Yeah, I would actually say that legitimately every family probably should uh, enter into some kind of um, legal disowning of children that can't rap. Because if we know in the future, really, the only way that you're going to go into the future is if you can lay down rhymes. Like if you can't rap, uh, you probably should be, you know, you're, you're going to be breeded out. So that's the future. If you can't make it, then you, you're going to be break it. The, theosophist. <laughs> I thought the future was going to be speaking in emojis. <laughs> well, we'll figure out a way to rap with emojis. I don't know how, but we'll do it. Theosophist. Yes. Oh, here we go. Here's a nice, nice, nice name. Theosophist. Have we lost access to a realist interpretation of the Bible, i.e. Steve Quayle's research on giants? Uh, first of all, uh, I don't think we need to go to Protestant evangelicals to understand the Bible. Um, the notion of the Nephilim is debated amongst the church fathers. Uh, I think that it, it is talking about uh, actual uh, angelic beings. So I've never had a problem with that. But I don't think we need uh, anything. We don't need the evangelical space to help us with that. Although I will say Dr. Michael Heiser does have uh, some good insight on the uh, divine counsel and all that. How how He says, how significant is this considering Jesus said a wicked generation seeks after a sign? Uh, I don't know how that relates i mean i i think that uh the context of when jesus says that is the 70 a.d destruction of the temple so he's talking about the generation in front of him standing there right that asked him for a sign and he says no sign will be given except that of jonah right and he's talking about his death burial and resurrection and so yeah, if you're not familiar with what partial preterism is uh, go look at that because luke 21 matthew 24 are talking about not everything, but largely talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. That's a huge part of the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy of the divorce of Israel. So um, thank you for that, though. Theosophist, hopefully that's helpful. I've done, by the way, multiple talks uh, on the beast system. If you go watch that talk, it's on preterism. Uh, there's a great uh, commentary, by the way, on the book of Revelation from a partial preterist perspective called uh, Days of Vengeance by David Shulton that I recommend. Anybody in uh, the Discord chat? It's open for them. Any Roman yeah, Catholics? Any, yeah. any Roman Catholics? Any Protestants? Any atheists? Any Muslims? It's open for them. There's no more atheists left on the server. Are you serious? They don't. They don't respond to any pings. Wow. Ever. They don't come back anymore. Well, We've no surprise. No in. surprise there. So. Yeah, Jay. Uh, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your creative process, like. Uh, about what? Uh, your creative process or the way that you think or analyze books and stuff like that like uh because you seem like you have a very deep uh very elaborate insight into everything that you get into and it's very interesting just wanted to ask you about that like how do you when you read books like what do you look for how do you look at them like what do you think what are you thinking 
Well, thank you for the compliment, but uh, everybody seems to think there's some kind of uh, special process, and there's not. Uh, I just I read actually read really slow, and I just make uh, little notes. There's no there's no pattern to the color codes. That just happens to be whatever note tabs are lying around. And what I do is I just summarize the important part on that page. That's it. So. <laughs> Sorry, there's not more mystery. I, I should I should spice that up a little bit and be like, uh, well, I first emailed Dugan and the Dugan tells me what magic ritual to uh, evoke, and then I do the the ceremonial magical ritual, and then the the demons enlighten me and give me higher consciousness. So maybe that's a better. We'll let the the haters can clip that section out, and then they can make an exposed video with that that little clip there. That's good. No, yeah, it's just, uh, but also I wanted to ask you, like, uh, does your worldview constantly is in, uh, yeah, it's, it's just like I'm coming of, of a noob in all of this, and I'm like, uh, so it's sort of understanding all these terms, but, like, is your worldview, like, always constantly in, uh, in position to analyze all this stuff, right? Well, I would say that my worldview, in terms of the, the basic foundational beliefs they don't typically change uh i mean I, i've had changes in my worldview over my lifetime i think most people nowadays have at least a few changes in you know where they come from whether it's moving from one church to another church one religion to another religion uh or they have a you know total shift in the way they understand something like geopolitics and how the world really works and and that kind of stuff and i think it's accurate to talk about it like there's different types of conversions i mean people that that uh, think about geopolitics in a normie way where they just believe the mainstream stories and this kind of stuff. They don't know about uh, espionage and how that works. They don't know about psychological warfare. That's a kind of conversion when people wake up to that. Um, and I think even within Christianity, even within Orthodoxy, conversion isn't a one-time thing. We're always having to convert, right? I mean, think about, again, you know, Father Deacon's always likening his um, leaving Darwinism, even as an Orthodox person, as another type of conversion. So I think that all of us uh, are always in need of converting, but not everything that we change our mind on is a paradigm level, you know, complete undermining of our whole worldview. Uh, hopefully that doesn't happen a whole lot, <laughs> right? I mean, hopefully we, we can get grounded in a solid worldview. Uh, I think Orthodoxy is the grounded solid worldview, and then we can kind of analyze uh, other things that that don't shake our whole paradigm and we can still be be wrong about right i mean i, I find myself being corrected on uh you know oh did i analyze that uh geopolitical event correctly right was uh you know this guy was this fake flag because of this or was it because of this right i mean you can be wrong about those things it's no problem and we can shift our our assessment of those things and that doesn't undermine our whole worldview right but something like uh, Jesus didn't exist, right? I mean, that would obviously that would obviously undermine the whole worldview, right? Yeah. Now, another question: Do you still uh, give classes? I, I heard about before. No, you I don't. Them. I'm sorry. There, there's just not enough time for that. There's, the audience has grown to be too large to do one-on-one -on -one tutoring, so I uh, just don't have time to do that anymore. All right. No uh, thank you, Jay. Yeah, man. Anytime. Glad I can be of some assistance. Uh, remember everybody that we will be doing, uh, the stream over on the rock, uh, not the rock from the mummy, but the rock from rock fin. So we'll be over there. I don't know what it would, might be funny to stream on the rock. Uh, yeah, he does have a pretty sweet smile. The rock stream on his shoulders stream. Uh, I'll sit up on his shoulders and do a live stream with, I'll be tapping on the computer on his head. Oh, that's, 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 that sounds kind of gay. I don't, let's not go there. That sounds kind of gay. <laughs> so uh, the other day, someone had a question. Um, oh, someone had a question about um, Christ uh, saying that he didn't know the hour or the day, and I was asking that his submission temporarily to that kind of state of affairs. It's similar to him undergoing um, death or any other blameless passion, right? No, I disagree with that, uh, and and, okay. uh, and the, the solution to this is, uh, this is of course a favorite of the Muslims and the Aryans. Uh, I'll put this, uh, this is letter 236 of St. Basil in the chat right here, so letter 236 is where Basil covers this issue, and he talks about how it's a manner of speaking, it's kind of like uh, when we speak of Christ by appropriation, as St. John Damascus says in book three of uh, On the Orthodox Faith, where he talks about Christ becoming a curse, he didn't literally become a curse. 
Right. It's like when Jesus says, there's none good but God the, right? God the Father. He's not literally saying no one else is good, right? Because he says that he himself is good later. He also says the Holy Spirit is good. So it's, uh, it's just like hyperbole and way of speaking where you speak as if, you know, look, the, can somebody mute? That's really loud. Uh, so it's like when somebody says, you know, look, dude, nobody knows this, right? He's not saying that nobody literally knows it, but that the Father as the beginning and Arche of the Trinity, he will determine all of those things in his due time. And even though the Son does know that for his for the for our sakes, he tells us, you don't even need to worry about that, right? But it's not that he lacked knowledge of that because because he's a divine hypostatious and many places in John it actually affirms that he's omniscient. Um, so I would say read that letter of St. Basil where he covers it extensively. And then there's also uh, this excellent article from uh, Orthodox website on this topic. Was, was Jesus ignorant of the time of his second coming? Uh, and I'll put that in the chat as well, which is a good treatment of this topic. So, and remember, everybody, come over to Rockfin later uh, this evening. We'll be we'll be going through um, the issue of. I'll put the uh, the essay in the Discord as well. I just linked it there in the the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, so remember tonight we'll be over there t uh, discussing uh, that UK um, Br British Ministry of Defense and German Ministry. Can somebody please mute? That's really loud. Bro, dude. I'm done. If you are. Dude. Can somebody please mute that guy? Oh my gosh. Thank you, Chase. Um, yeah, so uh, we'll be covering that British Ministry of Defense teamed up with the German Ministry of Defense document on altering and augmenting human nature. Yes, a white paper literally publicly on the UK website. UK government website. We'll be covering that later on tonight on Rockfin. Um, welcome, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias. He's in the house. Glad to see hey, you here. Guys. How are you? We are doing well. So we're answering QA questions. Uh, we've got open forum. We're answering QA questions. No, no, no. None of that on YouTube. None of that on YouTube. Uh, so, all right, so uh, anybody else who's up next? We got open forum. We had a couple angry, mean Protestant boys. Uh, uh, they got they got right, they got see. sent back to Clown Town. Hey, Jake, I had a question. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. I'll, I'll ask, if you want to ask real quick, that's fine. Just go. Okay. Yeah. I just had a follow up question on uh, like the, the partial preterism and like. Uh, trying to understand the transfer from the you know priesthood of Aaron to uh into the church and like you know people say I heard the question about like uh well how could the promise ever be taken away or like the transfer of the covenant could you elaborate like on the I have trouble with the details of like how it goes from the old testament into the new the new covenant and uh Okay, yeah, well, I mean, so like the, the, the first point I would say is that every covenant in the Old Testament is anticipating the one in Christ. That's why Paul can say all the promises in Christ are yea and amen in, to, to the Corinthians because he's talking about the promises of the covenant, right? So the covenants begin with Adam, right? The Old Testament itself says that Adam was in a covenantal relationship with God. The Noahic covenant, right? We have Noah as a type of Christ saving his uh, uh, family, a.k.a. the church. We have uh, the Abrahamic covenant, where uh, obviously Abraham is a type of Christ. Paul identifies in Galatians three and four, and Romans four and five that that uh, that, that Abraham, uh, the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled in Christ. We have, of course, the Mosaic covenant. Obviously, Moses is a type of Christ. We covered that extensively last night with uh, Seraphim Hamilton. Uh, and then, of course, th there's no question, I don't think, the, the, the Davidic covenant, right, is so totally Christological, right? Uh, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Not about David. Peter even makes this argument in uh, Acts 2 that it was not about David that he spoke, but about uh, Christ. Because David is dead in, these, in the tombs with us to this day. So how is it that the, my Lord said to my Lord, right? It's the Father speaking to the Son. That's Peter's argument in Acts and so the son, uh, when he ascended, sat down at the right hand of the father. And so he 
restored our nature. Now, one thing to keep in mind, too, is that the, the priesthood of Christ is not the Levitical priesthood. The priesthood of Christ is the order of Melchizedek, according to Hebrews 7 and 8. And the order of Melchizedek is, is not... Uh, now, Melchizedek is an actual historical person, but his priesthood was in, or an image, an icon of the eternal priesthood of Christ, right? So the son has been an eternal priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, right? Yeah. So his priesthood had... It, it, hold on. So it had no beginning in time. And so... So the, can you mute, dude? It's really loud. So his priesthood does not begin in time. When Melchizedek comes in history, he's just a type of the eternal priesthood that already existed. The Levitical priesthood that's set up is also a type of Christ, but it's different from the Melchizedekian priesthood. It's still, it's still enigmatic and symbolic of what Christ will do. And Hebrews uh, 8, 9 makes that argument very clear. And so there's not a uh, rejection of priesthood. There's a transference of the, the temporary Levitical priesthood back to the eternal priesthood that was always there, that always existed. So, the, so, so in terms of the covenants, we have two conf seemingly conflicting statements in the Old Testament. One, that God will divorce Israel for her harlotries. Right. Hosea talks about the harlotries of Israel, that God will divorce Israel. Father Deacon, can you mute, please? It's, it's, it's loud. Okay, so uh, the, but we also have promises that God will never leave Israel. So in Deuteronomy, towards the end of Deuteronomy, I think it's 24, 25, 26, somewhere in there. No, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the 30s, it's towards the end of Deuteronomy. And then you have in Leviticus uh, 24, 25, 26, and there you have the covenant blessings and cursings. And the warning is that if, you, if Israel disobeys, they will receive the penal sanctions and the, the bill of divorce and be vomited out of the land and be rejected. So when Hosea talks about Israel being divorced, and yet at the same time God accepting and bringing in Gentiles, the only way for that to be consistently fulfilled in, in the one hand that God keeps his promises and at the same time that he divorces Israel is what we see in the New Testament when Israel is divorced. She's given the bill of divorce and the covenant curses come upon her in the apocalypse due to her rejection of God, which is preeminently seen in the rejection of the Messiah. So she's vomited out of the land, 70 AD. She's exiled because of her, her rejection of Christ. That's what Jesus pronounces as the punishment in Matthew 23 and 24 and Luke 21. So the apocalypse is literally the unfolding of the covenantal curses that are pronounced in Deuteronomy and Leviticus for rejecting the Messiah, for rejecting God. So that's how God, on the one hand, keeps his promise to never divorce Israel because the true Israel is the church, which is Jew and Gentile, which was always predicted throughout the Old Testament, right? That the Gentiles would be brought into the covenant. And yet at the same time, God has divorced Israel, a.k.a. flesh Israel, because of her rejection of God himself. Ah, uh, okay. So like the physical Israel is divorced. Yeah, so in Galatians 4, Paul explains this as an allegory. He says, flesh Israel is like Hagar, the bondservant. Right. right. Yeah, I was just reading that. So it's like the transference is to the spiritual Israel. It's not, a right it's not a transference because it was always right. spiritual Israel. It's a fulfillment. Oh, I was trying to read, but yeah, that one passage where it's it's uh, prophesying a new covenant. I forget where it is, where, but it says, "I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel Jeremiah. and Judah." Yeah, it's, does that mean it's the same covenant in the church of like Jewish? Uh, yeah, but, yeah, the because because thing. these Old Testament, because literally dozens and dozens of times in the Psalms, all the way back to Abraham, in the prophets, Isaiah. God keeps saying, I will bring the Gentiles. The Gentiles are going to trust in him. He will be the light of the nations, and in him the Gentiles will seek. All the way back in Genesis 49, it said that the nations, the Gentiles, will look to Shiloh. And when Shiloh, the Messiah, comes, the scepter will depart from Judah. There won't be a royal house anymore in Israel, because that's the sign the Messiah has come. And guess what? In 70 AD, no more royal house. Yeah, so is Israel like the lost... Uh, are the Gentiles like the lost sheep of Israel and they're kind of being regathered in the church or is it, uh, I just, I well, I, I don't know about that, but I mean, G Jesus does uh, say that, um, I have other sheep, which are not of this fold, which I must bring in, which is talking about the Gentiles being brought into the church. So, 
Okay. Yeah, it's hard for me to just tease apart all the different, like, uh, you know, House of Judah versus House of Israel kind of being distinct and then how all that played out. But Well, that's, that's, so that's during the period of the kingdoms where there's a division, a split between the northern tribes and the southern tribes. So the northern tribes go into apostasy after Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and they set up idolatrous worship. They set up a state-funded temple, uh, which was uh, basically a reinstantiation of the golden calf. Uh, and so literally they just made a state funded state created religion for all the northern tribes and that's set up against the actual authoritative temple in Jerusalem right which is Judah which is the only place you're supposed to do it so they just they just apost all the northern tribes apostatized and they went into captivity with the, the Assyrians and then the Babylonians came and took away the the, the southern tribes <clears throat> Yeah, so there's never more than one covenant at any time. Like it, no. it says a new covenant with the house of Judah and Israel. It's still one, the same covenant. Correct, it's both. the same covenant. Yeah. Jay, this is all good information to you for if there's any listeners out there that are dispensationalists. Yeah, dispensationalists need to hear this, exactly. Um, and again, though they use words uh, like we believe in supersessionism, uh, which is not what the Orthodox believe in supersessionism. It's like a dirty, derogatory word. That, uh, oh, um, we replace. Well, that's the idea that there's two covenants, right? And hey, it's just not working out for the Jews right now, so I'm going to go. Yeah, that it's not, not. never been the teaching of the church. Right, and, and that's why Paul can say that true Israelites uh, throughout the Old Testament were all of the believers throughout the Old Testament, right? Abraham is a true Israelite. Noah is a true Israelite. Even though he's prior to the founding of the, of the tribe of Israel, Job is a true Israelite. Because Paul says that the true Israelite in any generation is the one who looks to the Messiah. Job prophesies, I will see my Redeemer on the last day. He prophesies Christ. That's why Job is in the Bible, because it predicts Jesus. Okay, All these Old Testament saints are only saints because of faith in Christ. That's why Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 5 say that the gospel was preached to the Jews in the Old Testament. Romans 4, the gospel was preached before to Abraham. Galatians says the gospel was preached to Abraham. It, there's only one gospel. It's the same one. The only, the only difference is that they looked forward to the Messiah coming. We look back. And, of course, the other difference being that they awaited the full uh, 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 notion of deification. I mean, they, they did have a sense of deification, as St. Maximus says, even the Old Testament saints. They couldn't have seen God if their noose wasn't cleansed. So, well, how could they have deification and grace if the Messiah hadn't come yet? Well, because his sacrifice is an eternal sacrifice. It's outside of time and space. So once Christ does that, it's applicable to the before and the after. Right. I'm not saying it's outside of time and space as if it didn't happen in time and space, but I'm saying that because he's the son of God, because he is divine, he can apply the benefits of his sacrifice both all the way back to Adam. So the grace that Adam has to believe the gospel is grace that comes from the cross of Christ. And St. Maximus has a great chapter on this. He says that all grace, all of creation is restored and healed via the cosmic scope of Christ's incarnation, death, burial, and resurrection. Gotcha. So, like, the only special thing about the tribe of Judah was that through the line of David, the Messiah would be born. It's basically, and we're conflating Correct. that one tribe of Judah with all of Israel, basically. Kind of, well, no, no. So, now, so, sometimes Israel can be spoken of in these names that cover the whole thing. So, sometimes they can be called Judah. All right. Sometimes they can be called Ariel in Isaiah. Okay. These are just names that are used to signify the whole nation. Gotcha. Yeah, I guess confusing with the, the different uh, terms, you know, Judah and Israelite. Uh, I just, I'm trying to understand that better. Well, typically it's just referring to the whole nation, although at times, again, during the period of the kings, it's it's contrasted because the ten northern tribes went into apostasy. And eventually right. eventually they, the southern tribes did too. But Yeah, and then they get taken to Babylon. Right. So it's like the, uh, yeah, I guess because these, these people predate even, you know, Judah himself. So they have, there must have be been like a larger thing than just that one tribe. But well, did, did you hear this? Did you hear the interview? Time. Did you hear the interview that we did last night? No, I didn't catch it. Yeah, pl you, you definitely want to listen to that. It's very relevant to the questions okay. that you're asking. So Seraphim Hamilton and I went okay. in, went to, we went into this question pretty in depth in terms of 
all of the 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 ways the gospel is preached in the Old Testament and in the law, even to the people of that day. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll check that out. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Do you know what's another good line, Jay? What? Remember what Christ says, not everybody of Israel is of Israel. Yes. Yeah. Well, even Jeremiah had said this too, right? Who's the real Israelite? Circumcise your hearts. Right. So even Jeremiah was already saying this kind of stuff. And that's why there's so many things in Jeremiah there that, that are similar to the ministry of Christ. Right. There's so many things in Jeremiah's life. He's a profound, overlooked uh, type of Christ, in fact. I mean, a lot yeah, of what a lot of what Jeremiah says to the scribes and the fair, the, the what will basically be the Pharisees of his day, is almost parallel to exactly what Jesus says to the scribes and Pharisees, especially in Matthew twenty three. Yeah, it always seemed like sometimes it sounds like it's specific to a genetic lineage, and then other times it sounds like it's like uh, more about hearing the words of God. So it's just like well, but at, during the period money. from okay, but from from. Abraham to Christ, it's both. It is that. So, right. so in other words, look. So in 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 Genesis, it's Adam and Eve, right? By Noah, it's a family. So it goes from two people and their descendants to a family, eight people in the ark. Then it moves to a tribe with Abraham. The tribe grows into a nation, the national covenant with Moses, and then it becomes the kingly covenant under David, right? So you see this expansion right it's expanding and then with jesus it's now open to the nations so there's a gradual consistent continuity of the covenants that leads to this opening and expansion and so that's why every covenant is just a type of the of the final covenant in christ gotcha okay that really helps thanks and at time at times uh uh paul for apologetic reasons will set up a contrast between uh, Moses and Christ. But the only reason he's doing that is not to say that the Mosaic Covenant isn't a type of Christ. Paul, by tradition, wrote a whole book called Hebrews to show that the Mosaic Covenant was picturing Christ. The reason he's doing that is for the apologetic purpose of showing the inferiority of the Mosaic Covenant compared to what Christ brings. That's all. But a lot of times you get dispens right. you get dispensationalists and these kind of uh, new covenant, they're called new covenant theologians that will set uh, the law in, in dialectical tension with the gospel. And that's all heretical. We don't, we don't buy any of that. Yeah. So is it correct that like their the Mosaic covenant is can being canceled, right? And the new covenant is coming. Is that I wouldn't use the word canceled. I mean, Jesus, I mean, or, in a sense you can say canceled because it's, it's, it's Paul talks about the death of the testator. That's one of the images. But remember that uh, in Matthew 5, Jesus says that anyone who teaches against even the smallest of the commandments of the law will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So every commandment, even in Leviticus, has its apl application to now. Uh, and that's what we covered last night with Seraphim Hamilton. We went through a bunch of images and pictures and, and types, even in terms of the animal sacrifices in Leviticus that are relevant for Orthodox theology. You even have the same pattern in Leviticus of the three-tiered process of the liturgy, the three-tiered uh, ascent from uh, your offering to the, to, uh, ultimately to the Eucharist. That three-tiered ascent is still what's in our liturgy today. And that's all from yeah, Leviticus. Yeah. Okay, so it's I not... I don't mean canceled as in like uh, the law being abolished. I mean like the new fulfilled version of it. Yeah, yeah, right. I'm just saying that every. I'm just saying that even the ceremonial commands are still fulfilled in a spiritual way for us. Right. And if you didn't hear, we did a whole. Uh, we did a whole stream on this for three hours about uh, three years ago. Okay. So. I'll pull that up for you. It's called Bible Contradictions. I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, and it deals with the question of continuity and discontinuity between the Old and the New Testament. But okay. those are great questions. Thank you so much. Yeah, great questions. Yeah, it really helps. Thanks so much. Sure. Hey, Jay, can you hear me? I can. Hey, this is uh, Valentine. I'm actually the uh, Protestant archaeologist. You discussed a couple, so maybe a week ago, about yeah. some stuff about... Um, yeah, you had again, some really you had some great insights. Welcome back. Hi, uh, thank you so much. And you know, this question is not polemical or combative in nature. I don't care. I you... get to <laughs> so okay. I just wanted to know uh, what you guys thought about this. So I'm reading um, uh, the Antiquities of the Jews by Josephus, and in Book 
20, chapter 9, section 1, he mentions an incident where Festus, I say, quote, was now dead, and Albinus was put upon the road, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of the judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. So he basically describes the execution of St. James. And I was curious what the early church fathers thought of and how they addressed both passages in the Bible and in Josephus where they, you know, kind of seem to suggest that Christ had brothers, almost like it's taken for granted. Now, I, I studied Koine, and so I know that Adelphoi has a semantic range, of course, but I just wondered what you guys um, would respond to that kind of accusation. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, this is brought up in St. Jerome's debate with, uh, is it Vigilantius? Uh, I forget, that there's two different guys that Jerome has debates with, and he covers this issue. Um, what is the name of that treatise? Yeah, if you could send it to me, that'd be great. Yeah, and so, uh, right, so the word brother, as you said, doesn't always mean biological brother. So, and I mean, I, I, to my knowledge, this was, there was one guy that Jerome debated with that questioned it. And then, I mean, even the reformers held to the perpetual virginity. I mean, I know that that's not uh, going to be, you know, that's appeal to authority for you as a Protestant. But, uh, I mean, it's just the tradition of the church that Mary, as Ezekiel 44, is pretty clear that the gate uh, is never opened, uh, even though the, the Messiah passes through the gate. So that is an image of her perpetual virginity. So we don't see gotcha. the, the word brother doesn't always mean... A biological uh, physical brother and it it also just doesn't it doesn't make sense with the role of the theotokos that she would go on to have children being that she is intended to be the virgin bride of god we right, just we right. just always seen that and yes we do appeal to tradition for that correct we don't just base it on uh ezekiel 44 or biblical text we appeal we do appeal to tradition for that and so those Protestants okay. that were in here earlier making a big fuss about this, yeah, we, we don't have a problem appealing to the the, uh, the tradition of the church. They were like, it's just a tradition. <laughs> well, yeah, but tra everybody needs tradition. In fact, Protestants need tradition. You need tra Everybody needs tradition or else you wouldn't even know what the canon of Scripture is. Right, no. But uh, yeah, let's yeah, see. Let me find the... Oh, a, go ahead. No, yeah, definitely isn't an issue of primary importance to me. But yeah, no, it's definitely interesting to see. I, I'd love that if you have the reference there. Yeah, I'm pulling it up. Okay. I think Father Josiah has some did a video. It's it's uh it's Jerome's it. treatise called uh, Against Helvidius. That's it. Against Helvidius. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. That's all I had. I'll put that in the chat for those interested. But yeah, I, I th thank you for that, Father Deacon. I didn't know. Um, does he have a video, or is it in one of his books? It's in a video, and he also goes into the history of, uh, you know, first century Judaism uh, among the pious that there are actually traditions of dedicating uh, perpetual virginity as well. And he kind of goes into the, like what they thought about that and how how that wouldn't it's not an odd thing. Um, and then also her dedication. In the temple and he ties it. It's really good. I think it would do you know, I'm looking us. through his videos list. Do you do you know what it's called or I can't? I don't. Okay. But like when I find it all, I just remember a couple years ago coming across it and I thought you did a good job. Right. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm good in that as well. I would like to see that because I'd like to pin that or uh, link that in the, the show description. But um, yeah. So, uh, by the way, uh, what's your name, archaeologist guy? Indiana, jo Indiana like, Jones? Yeah, be, Valentine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, be my Valentine. That's an old gamer tag, so I'm not really proud of the name, but there it is. So. I don't care. I mean, you, so uh, did you hear the show we did last night with uh, Sir from Hamilton? Uh, no, I haven't seen it, no. I highly recommend that, too, because we we uh, spent quite a bit of time talking about Mary. Uh, we talked about Theotokos. By the way, I forgot to mention that, that guy who was in here earlier, That those goofy Protestant guys who spurged out. They... Uh, the whole, he said that there's no attestation to, you know, this, this, this view of Mary, this reverence. That's not true. The whole uh, council of Ephesus, uh, right. Theotokos, that's all right. Connected. So Marian doctrines are directly connected to Christological doctrines. And that's what the council of Ephesus shows us. Right. No, I actually have read uh, Nestorius and Cyril's correspondence and I'm totally on board with Theotokos. I guess that was just the one question about Mary that I really wasn't, you know, quite sure on yet. So yeah, I'll look into that. Thank you. I think the main objection was about the Dormition, I think, was what they were talking about. <coughs> right, <coughs> but... 
bring that up a lot, I guess. <coughs> right, but the Dor- the Feast of Dormition is uh, not like separate from all the other doctrines, right? That's how they they think in like a quote mine. Like I don't have to believe it until you show a church father in the second century that believes it. Yes. Well, guess what? Uh, you don't have a second, third century church father who has the Protestant canon, so we shouldn't accept your canon on your own argument. The reason that that idiot Dan Patristics fan, he like that's all he talks about. <laughs> that's yeah. Him. Yeah, you nailed it. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it's kind of rooted in academia too. I mean, the idea that you have to epistemically prove something from historical critical from analysis. a written text, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's all like contextual criticisms like that too. Especially from Calvinists who have to do the most insane gymnastics to justify their soteriology. <laughs> so my question then, so there's always going to be a first time a father writes something down. So you can have, I mean, and what's the criteria? Like, um, how many years has to go by? It, it ends up becoming arbitrary. Well, it was arbitrary, and, and all the church fathers yeah. that those guys cited this morning are not even ones that they follow. It's like the Protestant thinks that all I have to do is find a church father who uh, says something wrong or erroneous or out of accord, and therefore this proves Protestantism. I mean, it's just ridiculous. The guys they listed weren't even saints or canonical church fathers, right? It's like, here's what uh, 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 who Clement of Alexandria says, right? Like, well, who, we don't care what Clement. I mean, Clement's relevant, like origin's relevant, but... Uh, Clement is not a, a church father for us. Right? He's not a saint. And again, the, the burden of proof on them, these are developments, um, innovations, then where's the evidence of controversy? Exactly, uh, right, exactly. And, and by the way, uh, Lewis has shown in his excellent documentary that no, in fact, the earliest days of the church's worship uh, are all liturgical, And the liturgical worship of the early church proves the rest of our doctrines, right? That also proves the real presence. That also proves that sacramental, iconographic, right, uh, uh, flesh material aspect of worship. And so really, Protestantism is just Gnostic. That's the root of this. When they attack iconography, when they attack icons, they don't realize they're attacking the incarnation. We're talking about this at church with the priest that have you, have you guys ever heard this one across and say church not the church is not a building <laughs> yeah talk about word concept fallacy right like government's not a building guys yeah like all, all those super spiritual things are all built on word concept fallacies like oh i've, I've one up to you because right I, I believe in uh i have a relationship not a religion Why, why do you think relationship is like necessarily in conflict with religion? It's just silly. Mm-hmm. silly. Uh, the other one. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. That you'll get is that, uh, well, you know, Jesus, he criticized the religious leaders of his day for doing traditions and ceremonies. It's like, <laughs> what, mm-hmm. like what are you reading? Like, that wasn't why you criticized the Pharisees. Right, so again, we got people calling uh, icons pagan. Uh, again, you're just showing your ignorance. There's the, my essay from 10 years ago refuting the notion that uh, uh, icons are pagan. We've done countless streams. If you want to actually go through and refute the arguments, you're welcome to do that. But just saying and spamming the chat that icons are, are idols is just low IQ. It's just silly. Um I mean, these people don't realize that the Old Testament worship was iconodule. Do you not understand that? The people prostrated before the ark in the temple. Do you know your Bible, Protestants? Hello? All right, open forum, who's next? What's up? Anybody? We got a couple of people in vetting, but one of them, I don't know if we want to entertain unless you want something probably kind of silly again. Who's that? Um, Abid, Abid Allah. Sure, bring him on. All right. 1 1 1 equal 1. How 1 1 1 equal 1? <laughs> I'm ready for my arithmetic lesson. Let's You're go. right. Yes, please tell me because, of course, we say 1 1 1 equal 1. That's our argument for the Trinity. 1 1 1 equal 1. That's it. How does circle fit into square peg? It can fit into square peg. No, wrong game. No one good but father. Jesus said no one good but father. 
Like that. There's one. Ver- there's one verse in the Bible. <laughs> That's it, right? I took an Islam class in college, and we went to a few mosques. And like, it's pretty funny. It was like so similar to like a weird, so certain weird evangelical sects. Like they sat us all down for this like really goofy creation video, which made some like respectable points. But it was like, man, am I in like a 1999 like Midwestern Baptist church here? Like it was very funny. What's up? Let's let's hear this Muslim guy. I'm sure he's I'm sure he's gonna have a mind blowing unique argument that we haven't heard before. I just brought him in. He's not in the VC yet. I don't think. Okay. Jay, it's exactly like um, the eight. I always told my students there isn't an argument that I haven't heard. No. Yeah, I mean that's 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 <laughs> accurate. It's not that's not arrogance. Argument. You're right. It's not arrogance. That's actually what it's is the case, right? So if you've had a hundred debates with atheists. And I haven't had 100 debates with Muslims, but we've had a few. We've had two years of arguing with Muslims. Uh, I mean, I'm waiting for the new argument. <laughs> like, where's the new argument? I don't think I'm ever going to hear it, especially from the atheists. Like, they don't ever come up with anything other than the same old things. But, have you ever debated, like, any of these Freemason uh, occult-type people? Like, I, th- I think that would be fascinating. No, I, I mean, I don't... Long. No, I mean, I'm not opposed to that, but... I don't recall. Uh, well, we did know, we did a debate with Marty debate and tell me how interesting that. Yeah, was. exactly. I mean, there's Marty Lee, right? Just I mean, a retard. <laughs> well, we did a debate with uh, that Gnostic boomer dude, Scott Smith. That's probably the closest thing to that. But you uh, yeah. you can go see how that how well that went. <laughs> I want one of those people to like actually like passionately believe what they believe. They never do. It's like the, that old guy. It's like, come on, man, like defend your position. Well, usually, yeah, that's what we we find out is that people a lot of times are like making it up on the spot. It's like, let me uh, let me construct a system like here on the spot. Let me, let me, <laughs> literally, right? I mean, that Father yeah, Deacon. Every time, I'm like, you don't believe that every single time. Well, what if I those. say? Well, what if I say there's a planet where there's a supercomputer and there's no God and a complete you know, the, the JF type of thing, right? Well, what if we're in an alternate dimension where God doesn't exist? Well, what do you say to that? <laughs> Jay, Jay, that world, that world is this one, Jay. Yeah. I win. Right. Such a classic life. I still don't understand what Jeff thought he was arguing with that. Like, I think he thought that if you could conceive of a world where God didn't exist, that I think he was trying to say that then, then that would show that it wasn't necessary. Well, because his, his life, he said humans are computers, and you admit, and then if that world can exist, then well, we're the computers, and we exist, and we came up with. All oh, this is stuff. that where like, he was going basic. with that? Okay. Yeah, like he thinks every we're time just biological electro electro with, machines. Every time someone comes with that argument, they don't understand that the questions about the preconditions for logic, and they're right. trying to argue for a logically possible world exactly. without justifying why yeah. it has to be logical. Yeah, they possible. don't understand that it's a prior argument. It's an argument about the, what's prior to doing logic. It's an argument about logic itself. And by the way, in my in the new regime, um, with the new emperor that's coming in, um, we're going to require um, these devotees of scientism and all STEM uh, students to take at least two philosophy of science uh, classes, um, uh, a couple philosophy classes, and then ethics class. What do you say? Uh, and the world will be a better place. And the world Father. will be a better place for you and me. Father DK, uh, you know that book you have, The Philosophy of Science, The Central Issues, the one from grad school? Yeah. I, get, I, I had JF read that, and he basically rage quit before he could do a review of the central issues. People in the chat He's don't like, even know who words, JF is. Where y'all been? <laughs> word, word salad, right? Is Every yeah, 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 I don't, I don't, who cares, by the way, I mean, I think he's just, he's just trolling to get uh, low IQ Christians no, to come on. And, what I said, I tweeted out, I'm like, he, no one watches him anymore, so he needs he just, to He's just trolling to get, yeah, he just wants low IQ Christians to come on and argue with him, and then he can be like, ah, I dunked on you, low IQ Christian. He doesn't even want that, he just wants their views, because it's changed. Hey, good job, he makes no money. He, like, good job, good faith to get yeah. him to even read that, I'm, like, some of it, like, I'm impressed. Well done, brother. Yeah, I had him do a review of like the major philosophy of science books, and he loves, ironically, he loves like Fair Band, right? Because he, he comes from the science world and wants the kind of anything goes philosophy. But the the arguments, the meta arguments, I think go over his head because he in the debate with uh, uh, 
J, he actually does that. I think it's the Lewis argument that the possible worlds are actual because yeah. he's creating them in his mind right away. Yeah, Father Deacon, I know, like, in. Talk about sci fi fantasy, it. dude. <laughs> <laughs> Taking one logic course kind of broke me out of materialism. Like it took a couple years to take root, but it, it, it brought me out of it. That it does. Just, that it uh, does. All right. Anybody else? Open forum. Who wants to talk about topics? We got a uh, super chat here from RD5K. I had to have a little bit of sugar here. I'm getting my, my beatus is kicking in. My Wilford Brimley beatus. For three dollars, greeting to all the ortho bros. I'm a fan of everyone's channel. You're a fan of everyone's channel, literally everyone. I don't believe that, dude. So you're a fan. <laughs> <laughs> you're a fan even of uh, possible, even possible world fans. I mean, uh, channels. I'm trying to think. You're a fan of the Elsa Gate channels. I'm trying to think what is the worst cringe YouTube channel. Uh, my buddy is also orthodox, but he's into. Sorry, we're not covering that topic. Um, no, sorry, not covering that topic. So let's move on. Um, Abid Allah is um, is in here if you want to debate. Jay. One 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 equal three. One 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 equal three. <laughs> What's up? So here we go. As you guys know, the way this Discord works, we allow the opponent to present whatever arguments he wants. He can have the floor for as long as he wants within reason. You can't talk for an hour. Go ahead. to begin with rather just to clarify your position so I don't end up straw manning you here uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah do you uh, concur with Basil the Great's uh, understanding of the distinction between usia and hypothesis of course every Trinitarian has to help hold to that yes I mean there are of course different conceptions of the distinction like you know for instance uh, Aquinas is a very different distinct understanding of the distinction he just sees it as relational so well i mean the orthodox the, church the, is right we don't hold to aquinas so you know i'm orthodox then if you know that you should know that i'm not going to hold to aquinas's view of it yeah, there's a lot of there's different people who are heterodox in some respects so is this uh, is this jake no it sounds like jake <laughs> No, it's not Jake. Uh, I'm definitely not Jake. Jake is more. I'm, I'm Salafi. He's very okay. Go ahead. Very philosophical and uh, yes. Not, so we do affirm definitely. the distinction between nature and hypostasis. So go ahead and present whatever argument you'd like. All right. So uh, if uh, under, if I understand Basil correctly on this, the distinction between usia and hypothesis is the distinction between the general and the particular. That's this one aspect of it. It's not it's, it's not reducible to that. That's one aspect of it, yeah. This from his letters, as far as I understand it, of itself is not what is the basis for Trinitarian monotheism, rather the unity of the energies is because he, as he... Um, no, that's just uh, one signifier. No, 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 no. That's just one signifier of the unity. The unity is the person okay. of the Father. The hypostasis of the Father is the RK principle and fount and source of unity in the Godhead. Okay. But Basil says that the difference between the usia, usia and hypothesis is the difference between general and particular. It's part of it. It's not reducible to that. Well, can you explain what other elements are there? Well, there's uh, different ways in which there's many in God. There's many persons. There's many energies. There are different roles in the way that God uh, operates in creation and redemption. For example, the Father does not become incarnate. So there's different ways we speak of different distinctions in God, right? So not everything in God is reducible to one and many or to general and particular. Uh, yes, there is a relationship between the general being uh, the, the common nature that the three persons share, the particular being three particular individuated persons. But hypostasis is more than that. It's not just reducible to the general and the particular. So you have to look at the totality of Basil's works, you can't just look at Epistle 38 uh, or, or a specific section and say, that, oh, he's only saying that hypostasis means that. Yeah, well, it, it, three men would have one nature and three hypotheses. It's an right? analogy. It's an analogy to the created order. He says many times over that the similarity between creatures and God is not identical in the fact that creatures are distinct when they're three separate hypostases. Right, and as far as I 
understand it, the big distinction is that three different creatures would have completely separate energies, whereas no. in the Trinity understanding, they all have a, no. a, a shared energy. No, you're confused because in one sense, all human beings have the same energy because they have the same nature, but they have different energies in the sense that I instantiate human nature individually as an individual right. hypostasis. But in one sense, we have the same nature in, considered as actions of nature itself or qua, nature qua nature. Okay, as far as I understand it, energies is not uh, an element of, it, it, it has nature as a basis, but energies are actions and attributes. So Correct. if one man is six feet tall and another man is five feet tall, that's not an energy. That that's nature. not an energy is action proper to nature. Energy signifies what kind of nature. So if I build a house, that's an action proper to human nature. It signifies energy, the process of actually doing and building a house. Right, but the energy is distinct from my nature. It's not identical to it. The energy of building a house is not identical to me, but there's an aspect of me in my energies, and so that's why we say the energies are personal. So the same way, for God, God's actions are proper to divinity. They signify the divine divine nature. They're not identical to the divine nature, but they signify who He is, and He's present in every one of His actions or energies. Now, I can uh, bring up Basil's letter on this. Okay. I've read all of Basil's letters. I'm not trying to be rude to you. I've read, I know what's in Basil's letters. I've read them all. I've read all of his works. They're in English. Then you know that he does have a letter where he explains the distinction between Usia and Hypothesis. I just said letter 38 talks about it. Okay. So, and he says it's the difference between general and particular. And I just said it is that, and it's not reducible to that. Like, how, do you not understand the distinction between admitting that that, yes, he talks no, about that? I'm, I've cited that on I'm, Twitter. I put it on Twitter two, a month ago that he says that. I'm well aware of it. Do you not understand what we, what a reductionist that. move is? But well, I'm sure that there are other elements of it too. I'm saying this is the main ones he lists, but I'm sure that there are others. But I'm saying all of these elements, if you if you if you didn't weren't a monotheist, let's say for example, if you had a different religion that had that believed in three gods, they would use the exact same terminology. They would say one usia, three hypotheses. And no, you're just misusing the quote okay. because it's, do you understand what analogical predication is? And your own Islamic tradition does the exact same thing, and then you turn around and say, "But you guys can't do it when, we, but we can do it." Well, you also accuse us of saying that Allah doesn't resemble creation when Dionysius the Areopagite says the same thing in your tradition. I don't know what you're talking about. He says in one sense he does resemble, which is the energies, and in another sense he doesn't, which is the essence. So we have an essence-energy distinction. Your religion does not have that distinction, so I don't see how you can but say we're talking in no with, sense. You, can, you, consider, you consider attributes to be nature, right? Attributes are not nature. Not they are energies. Okay. So height, for example, would be an energy. Because no, an it's not. What are you talking? You don't. Know, that's an idiomata. That's a characteristic. Energy is action. Okay, you're talking about creatures having you, properties. Is not the same thing as, as an attribute. The way God has attributes. All you've so, done is all you've done is confuse things that are proper to creatures with what we say about God, and it's the other way around. You can't say, for example, okay. let me give you an example. So when the fathers talk about uh, begotten, okay, everybody says, oh then you're saying God has a temporal succession of creating a son. And so there's two gods, but it's not, it's an analogy to the way that the way that it's similar is then is in the fact that there's a shared nature between the father and the son. The way that it's dissimilar is that God's begetting is not temporal. It's not another God. It's this distinction of hypostasis. So again, you're just, tr you're trying to take the, the dissimilarities and make them similar. It's not, you, do you know what, do you know what univocal predication is? doesn't make somebody else somebody's son, or else the spirit would be his son too by this logic. Okay, again, so you don't that know what you're talking sense. about. You're not listening to the point. It's an, do you understand what an analogy is? Yes. So, no, you don't, because your arguments are based on univocal predication. Well, obviously, I reject you university of being myself so no uh, by the way your church also you, your sect also rejects an analogia so you don't know anything about allah because you don't have any analogical predication now before i can respond to this criticism we have to clear something up when we talk about uh, god's attributes or properties are those his nature or his energies are you asking me or are you talking about your position 
Yes, I mean your belief on this. Yeah, you're just taking features of creatures like height and thinking that that God possesses those things. Like we're not talking about creatures; we're talking about the Creator. Like dude, dude, dude that was your world. argument. You just gave this argument. You talked about height that creatures have. Yeah, of course, because that's not, that's not an attribute that the way that God has attributes. So you can't use that argument. Okay. It's a dumb argument. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, not use this argument. I'm just saying, do God's attributes fall under his his qualities his attributes fall under his nature or his energies they are energies i already told you this okay so god's attributes are his energies correct so then okay so if you it, what is the difference then his nature is just his essence then it has nothing to do with his energies no that is, there's a distinction between right, okay, essence so and energy energy Peter says we become uh all right so dude I don't, what are you talking about what is your argument in the Bible, in Peter's epistle, he says we, you know, we join to God in His nature. No, the word, the, the word there is talking about that we are made divine. It doesn't say how we're made divine. How we are made divine is covered in the rest of the text that talk about how we're made divine, which is by the energies. But he uses the word nature. It's just the word. Yeah, we we participate in divine life, and so the energies come from the divine nature, but they're not identical to it. So by nature, he means the essence. No, or he the means energy. the energy. Okay, a lot. When you read the New Testament, properties, though, yeah. right? When we say nature, you mean when you're talking about God, and you say nature, you mean his qualities and properties, right? God doesn't have qualities, so I don't know where you're getting like this. Love, I mean, it's not a quality. And, and that, there are not. There, God, God has no qualia. He has no accidents. Do, which do, would you say that is so quality? Maybe then? you should learn uh, learn Peter, about the theology before you try to come debate it, because I don't even I don't think uh, you understand what we say. So can I tell you what we say first before you try to absolutely. create a, a word trap absolutely. here? So the energies of God are just simply God's manifestation of Himself to creation to the created order. They're not only manifested to the created order because obviously He eternally possessed love. He eternally radiated glory. So they're not just created, but when we're speaking of them in terms of redemption, typically we're talking about his manifestation to creatures. So we would say God's actions, his attributes, uh, even the logi are types of energies. So there's different types of energy. Some are eternal, some relate only to the created order. But everything that we know about God is manifested to us energetically, all of them. Even the attributes, you can talk about attributes. But even the attributes ultimately are energetically revealed to us. So that's it. And the analogy that we make, listen, an analogy means there's an aspect of similarity and there's an aspect of dissimilarity, right? The similarity is limited. So when we talk about God's love, it's similar to human love. When we talk about God's energy, it's similar to the way that a man builds a house, right? A man takes his blueprints in his mind and he constructs the house according to what's proper to human energy. He goes, he puts his energy into that. The action and energy of building the house is distinct from the person themselves. But that action or, or, or energy is manifesting or proper to human nature, just as all human actions are. So there's, we say there's a distinction between the action and the nature that produces that action or the person that has the nature that produces that action. But that doesn't mean that, that, that it's a one-to-one -one correspondence that everything that's true of the creature is then applied to God. How do we know what's applicable to God and what's not? Well, that's where theology comes in. Theology tells us the way in which analogy is applicable and isn't applicable, right? So in one sense, yes, we can uh, predicate positively, cataphatically things of God because he's revealed them to be so. God is like us in that he possesses attributes like being a father, like being merciful, like being a judge, like being uh, provident, right? All of these things are similar to the types of things that humans do. But obviously he infinitely transcends those things too because he's uncreated, right? He's not temporal. He's atemporal. Even though he can act in, in time and space, he transcends even the positive predicates. And that's why we make a, a stress on apophatic theology. So when we use words like cause, the father as the cause, it doesn't mean temporal cause. It doesn't mean beginning in time. We mean and say over and over that he's eternally the cause of the sun. He's not eternally the cause of the world. And this is Athanasius' whole debate with the Arians to distinguish between the eternal begetting of the sun and the creating of the world ex nihilo in time. So I, I'm just trying to tell you that we make, we make clear where we uh, make positive predication and where it stops. Very good. So then the question, 
religion is or, or qualia, uh, nature. Or God doesn't have quality. God. I don't know where you're getting. God doesn't have qualities. He doesn't have qualia. He doesn't. No. Okay. So mercy isn't a quality. Mercy is an energy. Okay. So he's merciful. Would not be. So so can I can I so your theology is literally ripped from a couple uh, atomist and primitive Aristotelian sources. All of that theology is ripped from the Greeks. You import it into the early Islamic tradition, and that's all you have, right? Are you an occasionalist? Jay, Mr. Dyer. All right, he's he's not going to answer. He's gone. Just, all right. I don't accept any of the ashari use of the Greek. God, it's very, very different. I mean, you're talking about qualia. You're talking about qualia, so I don't know where you get this idea. Don't, don't be careful. I mean, I'm not here coming saying, you know, your theology is this and that. I mean, I might say that in other contexts, but in a debate, I maintain a level of civility. I don't go, you know, you're just a bunch of pagans and things like this because this is not a correct way. I didn't say you're a bunch of pagans. I'm talking about the early development of your philosophy. You're trying to do philosophy yeah. right now. So you're saying, I don't do philosophy. You're trying to do philosophy, talking about qualia. That's from philosophy, right? Uh, from, uh, philosophy is obviously a very, can be very ambiguous. By philosophy, I mean uh, falsifa, obviously. Okay, where uh, does, where does the notion of qualia come from? Do you, do you think that the Quran is the beginning of the, the discussion of qualia? No, I, I use this because it's, it's more familiar to you. Obviously, the, the correct terminology, from my perspective, is Asma wa Sifat. His, his names, his, his, you know, his being and his names, uh, 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 these are his, his naming qualities, uh, or however you want to particularly uh, translate that as. But I don't agree with the introduction of, of Greek thought into Islamic theology. That's something that I oppose in my aqidah. The idea of people having qualities or characteristics is not something that the Greeks invented or that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so do you do you do you agree? Not, so do you affirm? Not to be, not to be rude, but the, the term isn't qualia. Qualia doesn't have to do with qualities. Qualia is a technical uh, philosophical term in philosophy of mind that means uh, the qualitative uh, subjective experiences of what it's like. Um, it's uh, well, it has to do with sense data, right? And his he's talking about the properties of uh, created beings. And he's thinking that the characteristics or properties of created beings is the way that God possesses. So he thinks that a, a property is identical to an energy. Uh, look, just to be clear, you understand that I don't subscribe to any uh, platonic conception of being... I, I didn't say you're talking about it. to the work of... I know, I but I mean, when you're talking about this distinction where you just have the like the like the phenomenal and the nominal I don't, distinction between I don't, quality and essence, I don't make the. I don't, would, would, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude to you, but where did anything to do with Kant come up in this? I'm not. I'm not. Look, because you said empirical, because somebody can have a characteristic that's not empirically identifiable. Like somebody, for example, can be a very good person without you know any empirical data on that. They could have good intentions there's a lot of, these are called the unseen and there can be unseen qualities so now, i don't understand how this relates how does this relate to what we're talking about i'm, I'm lost well when i said qualities you corrected that to quality and then later on you you clarified and said that uh, god doesn't have qualities within orthodox theology so again qualia is a very broad thing you can go back to cicero i mean it, this is an ancient term that's broad i don't know what sense you're meaning it here so you what what you referred to was properties or attributes or characteristics or idiomata right like i have a snub nose and so therefore i'm going to say that uh, if i predicate that of god then that's an energy no me possessing a snub nose is not an energy all i was trying to do is tell you that what you're calling idiomata or characteristics are not the same thing as energies uh, okay very well there so if we're clear then when we talk about god's nature the way Peter would refer to it, he meant his energies, not his essence, correct? No. Again, you're haggling over a term that's just talking about the way that we're united to divinity. It's through the energy. Well, because nobody, agree that nobody teaches that we're united to the essence of God. So if you're trying to use that as a proof text that we're teaching that you're united to the essence of God, no, nobody says that. No, of course. I'm not trying to 
to put words in your mouth. I'm trying to clarify the terminology because I think you'll agree that clarifying terms is, is very important. I mean, this is a huge issue in a lot of ecumenical councils, how terms have to be used. So I have to understand when you say nature, yeah. like the way Peter says nature. Okay, but what nature, you're not aware nature. of is that not every term in the New Testament is the same and identical later on in the conciliar usages. Okay, so there's different senses at the time of the biblical writers when they, for example, talk about hypostasis. After the Cappadocians, okay. hypostasis takes on a more technical and nuanced sense. I see. So you're saying that Peter uses it to mean energies, but in a general sense, later theology, it, it's more specifically means essence distinct from energy. No, it's no different than if I said we're united to God. Okay. And then, so, well, how are we united to God? Are we united to God's person? Are we united to God's energies? Are we united to God's essence? Right. I would specify later on, and that's what happens in the clarification that Orthodox theology does later on. It specifies how we're united to God or to the divinity or to the divine nature. And how is the energies? So let me tell you something. So first of all, listen, first of all, we don't believe the Bible contradicts. Okay. So you can find a verse here that you can set against the rest of the teaching of scripture that will appear to contradict. And every heretic does that, right? We believe in a holistic canonical interpretation. So I'm going to look at all of the texts that talk about the energies, which is dozens of texts in the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's going to inform how I interpret second Peter. I'm not going to take second Peter out because it uses the word usia or fusis and say, oh, that only has one meaning in one sense. That's the word concept fallacy. You don't just take a Greek word out of the New Testament and say it only has one meaning, therefore I've sort of collapsed or, or contradicted Orthodox theology. It doesn't work like that. There's a whole debate for centuries. And by the way, at the time of Nicaea, the way hypostasis is used is clarified after Nicaea and, and it takes on a more technical sense. It's uh, okay, the, I, I, go ahead. Okay. Mr. Dyer, I'm not trying to pull like a, a gotcha or anything like that. I mean, there's no point in that. There's nothing beneficial. For yeah, that. I don't, I don't I believe that, that you're not trying to pull a gotcha, but go ahead. Well, if you don't, then at least keep it to yourself rather than making some sort of negative insinuation about me. I mean, okay, there's well, no, I mean, nothing, there's no you're, you're, you're in obviously me. in here as a Muslim to debate. So to come under the pretense that you're not here to debate is dishonest. I was asked by a Christian to come here to talk okay, I don't to have you. any control over that. So so do you want okay, to have no, an I'm argument? Not, or? I'm not here to give you a hard time. I mean, I can, but I'm not going to do it in this context in your own server, like talking to you, like. Well, I gave you the floor. So, again, you can have the floor okay. again. Present whatever you want. Okay. So, uh, since it seems like uh, this term is somewhat ambiguous. Uh, which, which term? Nature. Uh, we'll so, we'll again, your own we'll theology, do. even if I, I don't ex exactly know every nuance of your Salafi system, but uh, I assume you have some kind of apophatic theology. Most of Islam does. You'll find that our theology is, is very different from other theology. Like Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, doesn't believe that the Quran is eternal. There's a big difference. Yeah, well, I, I mean, there's a million different, I know, tr schools of Islam, yeah. I know. So, so uh, there's not well, apophatic theology. I mean, no, not really. Rather, it's okay. So, so Allah does. Do, so Allah does bear a similarity to creatures, then, for you. I wouldn't really call it a similarity. Well, the Quran because, says he bears no similarity. So, which do you affirm? Yeah, I'm meaning very carefully because I don't. I, I have to be certain what you mean by terms. But if we say, for example, that. Uh, Exists. Well, you tell me what it, what it means when the Quran says he bears absolutely no similarity to creatures. I will, uh, inshallah. So when we say, uh, like, something exists, we generally mean, like, it has, like, spatial dimension and temporal existence. Like, if we say, yeah. when he's a that's, exists, that's So that's something that applies to creatures, right? Yes, but when we say, okay. like... So uh, that's an analogy. So now you've, now you've brought Allah down to creatures. So, when we say Allah exists, we obviously don't mean the word is completely different. Like when we say when He's a okay, so exists, if, it's, if it's completely different, then it doesn't tell you anything about Allah. That's what I've been saying for months. If you want to give me the floor, then let me finish. And then, if you find any uh, things like objectionable, you I just said, said it's completely them. different, which refutes the whole point. Mr. Dyer, just, is it completely different or not? If you're in good faith, then let me explain it. But if you don't want me to... You have the floor. Explain it. 
But you're not you're not going to sophist sophistically talk around it. Explain that objection. Okay. If I have the floor, it means I can talk for a minute. Or yeah, two you're gonna if you're gonna so debate me about debating, we're not gonna do it. Explain the argument. So, when we say that uh, something in creation exists, we mean it has temporal duration, a spatial dimension. Yeah, you already it said is, that. And we would say it doesn't. Yeah, we already we, we already covered that. Exist. Right. So, but we say that a law exists, yet he doesn't have any spatial dimension right. or temporal duration. Yeah, though, so that's so absolute dissimilarity. Yes. So there's no Okay, so it doesn't tell you anything about a law. Well, yeah, so I the whole thing doesn't everything. work. That's what I've been telling you for months. I don't know why you guys can't get this argument. It's a very simple argument. How do you know anything about a law if that's the case? Well, it's very simple. We we know what he says. Now, no, that's not an answer. That that's not an answer to the objection. We know what he says. You just restated the position. How does that explain the objection? Okay, Mr. Dyer, correct me if I'm wrong. Please do. But you just make the argument. That. Stop using my name. This is not neuro linguistic programming, dude. Just make your argument. You don't think that he has any spatial, uh, any spatial dimension or temporal existence except for the incarnation, either, do you? I think that he does bear a, a similarity to creatures. That's what analogical predication is based spatial on. Spatial dimension or temporal existence. There's a similarity the in, yes, there's a similarity to the things in creatures like so love, like he mercy. Space, he has width and depth. No, again, your your response right, is based so on univocal predication. No. The, so the energies exists, do come down to us. The essence does not. You mean it. He exists in a way completely different than what we described. No, it's not complete. It is not completely different. It's analogically but, the well, same and different. Well, would you agree that when we say something exists, in a normal sense, we mean that it has spatial dimension and temporal duration? We don't have to use existence. Talk about Allah's mercy. Talk about any of the other 99 names. Aren't they likened to creatures? But you have to start from the... No, I want you to talk about the other. No, because you can sophistically get around the the existence argument, which I don't. I mean, actually, I don't think you consistently can. But what about mercy? What about love? Well, our mercy and love are hormonal sensations, and no, no. Obviously when it okay, so when it says Allah is merciful, yes. Okay, it what is mean the? That he's experiencing a hormonal sensation. Dude, I know that nobody is attributing to God created properties. But when you name and predicate of God, you're using created concepts and words. That's the whole point. But then you, but your argument, your system says that there's no similarity between Allah and creatures in any sense. And so all of the predication that you use, the 99 names, don't work. They don't tell you anything. It's a very simple argument. I just, I just pointed out, though, you, you, your theology agrees on this. Aspect. No, it does not. That's the essence That's energy distinction. Nice. I don't know how many times I have to tell That's you this. Very nice. Dionysius doesn't know he teaches no he doesn't he teaches the essence energy distinction in divine names very clearly he says the processions no he doesn't he says the processions come down to creatures yes he does I've read the divine names he says the energies are likened to creatures do you want me to go get the chapter and show you where he likens the created the creatures to yeah because because I know what Dionysius says mystical theology says like even i'm talking about the divine god names dude the, the divine names what you're talking about is what's yes. true of the essence of god we believe that you can't predicate positively of the essence of god so how do we know god letter 234 of basil the energies come down to us it's the same thing that Dionysus calls the processions and he even uses energies in the divine names again uh, let's just keep it simple he says you can't even ascribe existence or oneness to God according to him. The essence. I, do you not understand because that he himself makes the essence energy distinction? Of course. This is his main country. Yeah, so the yeah. things that we can't positively predicate refer to the essence. The things that we can positively okay. predicate refer to the energies. Good, okay. So, do you, uh, uh, to make it clear, uh, how many times do we have to make it in, clear? In uh, Islamic thought, uh, qualities like merciful are different from actions. 
How is that answering the question of predication? I'm making a very simple argument to you about predicating about Allah and your own system qualifies, qualifies and says you can't positively predicate of Allah because he bears no similarity to creatures. If he bears no similarity, then your words and your concepts, which are creatures, don't tell you anything. Would you say it again? Okay, yeah, exactly. The, you're asking... So you don't have an the answer to that objection. You're just going to talk around it. Are actually, within Islamic theology, his acts, or his energies as they're called in Eastern Orthodox theology, are known to his creatures, obviously. Like if he destroys something, we can see that that's known to us. His. How do you know about Allah? You're just talking around the objection. How do you know about Allah in your system? We know him by his actions. But they're not anything like creatures, right? When you predicate about them? No, this is right. his quality. Yeah, exactly. Is, is, the Quran, is the Quran a creature? Uh, no. The Quran is not a creature. So the book's not a creature. The Musaf is. Obviously, his words, if he says something, that's not a creature because it's an articulation with his voice. Okay. Is his voice eternal and uncreated, or is it created? His voice is uncreated, but. It uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. Like, so, like, what, oh, Muhammad's true. voice is uncreated? But when he articulates something... Well, you just said Muhammad's like voice is uncreated. So, a, create, a creature's voice is uncreated. He said his, evidently referring All to... All right, no, you're done. So, no, you, yeah, you, yeah, you're done. No, I asked you specifically about when the Quran is revealed, when it becomes written down, when it becomes a book... Is that a creature? Is the book a creature or is it uncreated? A musaf, a writing of the Quran is obviously a creature. Okay. There's no similarity between the creatures and the uncreated in your book. So you don't know anything about Allah. So you actually concur with okay, this. Okay, we're done. You say the only thing you yeah. know is... No, I explain we don't concur with that. We don't deny an analogy. You do. So we're not going to do that circle cycle again because he's trying to trap us. By the way, he said he wasn't going to come to trap us. He tried to trap us. He, I don't know how many times we have to tell him that we are saying two things. Analogical predication relates to the energies, not the essence. Nobody can positively predicate of God's essence. Hence the essence energy distinction. His system does not have an essence energy distinction like our system. Hence why it's not a problem for us. And he's just going to keep repeating that same argument. And yes, like Sam Shimon said, that guy's a waste of time. Next up, who's up? Do you notice that he doesn't address the objection? The, Allah, the, 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 the Quran says no similarity. He just goes through all these texts, tries to deflect to our position. Won't talk about this, the, the, the argument. There you go. Anyway, it's open for This is on one quote to the exclusion of others. Takes things out of context. Mr. Dyer. Mr. <laughs> Dyer. <laughs> it's open for him. Anybody else can speak up. Well, there's a lot of people in the, in the chat talking smack, but they won't come to bait. People are like, why are you mean? I'm not being mean. It's just we don't la allow people to do sophistry, right? So you can't deflect and talk around the arguments and avoid the objection. Uh, no, address the position, address the argument if you want to come on. I gave that guy the floor at the beginning. Do you remember that? I said, you can have the floor. You can talk as long as you want. And by the way, every time we do that, they don't come and present an argument. They ask a question. And then I respond, and then they say, you won't let me finish my argument. Dude, I, you could have the floor. You could talk for 10 minutes if you want. I'll give you 15, 20 minutes. You can make all the arguments you want. But they won't do that. Anyway. And I posted a link to the Discord about 10 times on the YouTube chat, and nobody's joined from it. Yeah, I mean, anybody's welcome to come. And, and... But see, look, I can tell when, when an argument is being made, and... 
somebody is skirting it. If you've done enough debates, it's you can tell when people are doing that. Okay, so that the, so the the intensity is because I'm not going to put up with the people skirting the point that's being made. And his he just kept going back to, but you believe that apophatic theology is true, yeah, but not for the energies. But Dionysius says that you can't predicate of God. Yeah, of the essence. I mean, it's not even controversial. Just read the divine names. He teaches the essence energy distinction clearly in the divine names. Uh, Mark Passio will not debate me. We've already asked many times to have a debate with Mark Passio. So every time you guys suggest somebody to debate, we've already reached out and they won't do it. So. By the way, reminder, we will be doing a, uh, another edgier stream tonight edgier topics not appropriate for the soft hearts over here on youtube uh, and that will be on the rockfin and remember that rockfin is free you can see a lot of free content over there uh, they're a based free speech platform and there is the link so okay. that, yep go ahead uh, not a super intense question or anything but you said you uh I know you've taken a break from some of the debate reviews, but have you, and you put it on your list a while back, but have you thought about reviewing the, was it the, it the Wilson-Harris debate? Yeah, I think uh, that's it. I forgot, I forgot about, about, about that one. one. Uh, uh, no, I forgot about that one. That'd be a good one to do. Just because I think a lot of Calvinists, like, because, like, they like the presuppositional argument, but the only one they've ever heard is from Doug Wilson right. or from other people like that, so it would definitely be an easy way of them to be like, oh, wow. Yeah. I noticed Doug Wilson uh, did a debate on that modern day debate channel, which is pretty funny because it's a bunch of like fat earthers and <laughs> people over there. And that's okay, the if you're interested, I could, I could, I know a lot of people from Christchurch. If you wanted to debate him, I could put some feelers out. Uh, yeah, I would debate Doug Wilson. I'm not afraid to debate Doug Wilson. But he debates the local Catholic priest, so. Yeah, I've seen a lot. I've been I've seen Doug Wilson debates for years. Um, I used to read Doug Wilson books. So <laughs> no, I can uh, I can ask some of his deacons, quote unquote deacons. Yeah, I'm not sure what what would be the best topic to debate Doug Wilson on. It can't be like it can't be too generic like orthodoxy or Calvinism. It's got to be something a little more. He probably I think would, he probably want to debate something like the nature of world of tradition. Because, like, they're pretty, like, they're, they, they read a lot of, like, saints, you know, like, I know. that kind of stuff. Yeah, so, like, yeah that's, probably... that's how he runs his whole scam, is to give the impression that uh, his church that he's made up is in continuity with uh, the historical church. And I think if you could get a debate topic that kind of brings that to the forefront, mm -hmm. it would be mm -hmm. pretty obvious who, uh, who actually keeps to the tradition. <laughs> because it's a LARP, it's like a total LARP, like, the whole thing. And I know yeah. that becomes pretty obvious when it's even when they debate Catholics, it looks obvious. Yeah. So again, all the people that you guys in the chat are suggesting, um, those are people we've all reached out to. Um, Alan Rule's not going to do a debate. Mark Passio's not going to do a debate. Uh, anyway. But we got. Uh, I have a question. Sure. What's up? Go ahead. Uh, hello, Jay. Uh, what are exactly the idiomata in our theology? Well, so idiomata of the in the tri triadology, right? So this gets into uh, the questions when it comes to Christology, and so if you get into the the Leontii, this is Cyril of, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Leontius of Byzantium and Le Leontius of Jerusalem. By that time, the debate over Christology after Saint Cyril uh, has gotten into like what are the defining characteristics of the incarnate hypostasis of Christ, and so the idiomata comes up as just the notion of characteristics. So did Christ have unique idiomata uh, as he walked around and, you know, he had a certain kind of uh, nose, he had a certain kind of face, he had a certain kind of build, a certain height, certain hairdo. Those are the idiomata, but those are not what, uh, I, that's not what we reduce hypostasis or person to. So in the history of the debate over hypostasis, it has a couple different crucial usages, one of which is the entitative sense. Could somebody mute, please? Hypostasis, somebody mute, please. Hypostasis in the entitative sense refers to 
uh, an individuated nature, right? Just an in, just an individuated uh, being, typically uh, referring to sentient beings. Although sometimes hypostasis has a usage even outside of that, which John Damascus covers in Fount of Knowledge. But so it's true that Christ has idiomata that make him uniquely him, but that's not what a, a hypostasis or person is. So he's he's more than that because he was a hypostasis, a person before he took on human nature, before he had those human idiomata. Um, you see, actually, the difference between catch fried fish and farm raised catfishes. No, uh, not at all. So, uh, like, so let's go back to the entitative and the and the. Can somebody mute, please? Dude, talking about catfish, dude. So. Okay, so early on, the the word hypostasis has a an entitative sense. It signifies an instantiated nature. If you read the uh, Meyendorf Byzantine theology book, he covers this. They're called the old old Nicenes, and at Nicaea, some of them uh, after Nicaea, some people had a problem with the modified uh, notion, the nuanced notion of hypostasis in the Cappadocians. Okay, because the Cappadocians refined this to be more precisely about the inner core subject or agent or consciousness in sense in the sense of a personal subject okay so the personal subject sense of hypostasis is what's being used after Cyril and at the fifth council specifically because the fifth council is typically talking about who who is the the inner subject that is taking on that human nature is the second person of the godhead so he's a person from all eternity the second person of the Godhead. So in one sense, <clears throat> when he assumed human nature, his personhood did not change. Person qua person. But in another sense, he became composite because he assumed a human nature. So what's composite is the two natures that he, the second person of the Godhead, possesses now. So that's two senses of hypostasis. This is very crucial in the debate over many centuries. It's what the Fifth Council comes to the resolution for in rejecting the Antiochene reading of Chalcedon. So the reason there's a fifth council is because there's a lot of debate over Chalcedon. And the fifth council resolves the issue by saying that the neo kyrillian interpretation of Chalcedon is the only way to read Chalcedon. And it rejects the tertium quid view of the Antiochenes. There's also people on the internet right now running around that have that same condemned view. So... When we understand that, that's how we distinguish persons by the inner core subject of who they are, the agent. And that's not identical to idiomata, even though Christ as an incarnate human being possesses his unique idiomata. So the point is that none of the traits, energies, attributes, or idiomata, or even mere individuation are identical to what person is. That's key. Because the heretics always confuse attribute, nature, action, will, or energy with person. Literally, all the time. Every heresy, as John Damascus says, is some deviation on confusing nature and person. Or, reducing in a reductionist way, actions, attributes, idiomata with person. In fact, in Trinitarian theology, we even say that the relations are not identical to the persons. The relationship of the father or the son is not identical to what the person of the father or the son is. And that's another problem for the Roman Catholic position because they say persona et relatio, person is relation. No, they're not. Persons are subjects. Relations are predicates. You can't reduce person to a predicate. It's stupid. But that's literally what Aquinas says. Aquinas says persona et relatio. And Loschke has a phenomenal critique of persona et relatio in the Roman Catholic system. Anyway, but yes, the whole Roman Catholic system is nothing but confusion of nature, person, will, attribute, etc. And yes, I'm sure they confuse idiomata as well if you were to really pin them down. Although, although they're supposed to believe what we say on Christology. I mean, if you read uh, Ludwig Ott, he actually has the correct understanding of the Fifth Council to be fair to Ludwig Ott. Is that helpful on idiomata or is that, does that, uh, is that more confusing? Yeah, thank you. But I was asking more in a Trinitarian way, like when St. Basil and other Cappadocians use idiomata to talk about the relationships between the, the divine persons, like the begetting and the being unbegotten, 
and all of that. Right, but but and and we can use that to pick out the the persons or to show the relations, but the relations are not identical to the subjects. All right, and another question: Would the three different person be differentiated? Oh, hold, different on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. With the what? Would the three divine persons okay. be differ differentiated as three distinct subjects? Or without those idiomata, or do they need them to be dif differentiated? No, so the uh, idiomata or the, the relations are necessary, right? There's not, it's not like the father could have not had a son. So in one sense, they're necessary, but they're not identical to hypostasis. So in other words, person will have a relation, but person is not reducible to relation. All right. AJ. Yeah. Um, why did Jesus have to die and resurrect in order to recapitulate human nature and not just merely snap his fingers? Well, because God chose to create and set up a world wherein natures have their own properties and their own sort of self-subsistent being and causal relations. So natures are natures in the, in the sense that they are what they are because God created them to be that way. So it's not a, a world that God set up where like you have this sort of uh, Islamic occasionalism where there's no secondary causes. God created a world where there are secondary causes and natures are they have their own uh, subsistence, so you could say. So for Christ to destroy the uh, inherent sort of corruption that had entered into human nature required him to take it on and to cleanse it and to deify it. All right, cheers. Thank you. Right, so the, the uh, position that you're talking about would be more like optimism or occasionalism or what's called theological voluntarism and some of the Reformation theologians who were nominalists held to that view. And the idea is that things don't actually possess natures, right? But for us, that would be a violation of the way that God created the world, which is that things do have natures. Man has a human nature that is, that is unique to him. It's, it sets him off, distinguishes him from animals, from other things. Animals have their unique natures that make them what they are. And so that's a reflection of the way God himself is and that God himself has a nature. He has a kind of internal logic to him. And so God's not going to create a world that's not a reflection of his logic or his truth, right? So he, he, he has a nature. He has a logic to him. I'm not identifying his nature with logic, but I'm saying that that's how God is. And so he's not going to create a world where at any moment, for example, the true becomes the false, where human nature suddenly becomes animal nature, where, so no, things have to have the natures that they have. And so we reject nominalism and we reject theological voluntarism, which is connected to nominalism. And by the way, many Calvinists are actually uh, pretty close to occasionalism, like the Muslims are. Yeah, right. I Cheers. Sure. Wow, this has been a wild one today. We had uh, some uh, unruly, uh, childish teenagers, and then we had a pretty feisty Muslim discussion. It's still open for them. Bring whatever you want. Anybody who has a challenge, anyone wants to debate, you can have the floor. I will literally be quiet and give you as long as you want. But now if you come here in your allotted time and you say, what's your position? And then I reply... I'm going to come at you, right? So you got to present an argument if you want the allotted time. Uh, hello, Mr. Chair. Yep, sure. Who's next? Hey, Mr. Uh, Dyer. Yes, yeah, sir. Go ahead. Sorry. Hey, this is Jay Deal, the real over here. Okay. Hey, man. Um, so I'm an inquirer largely um, thanks to finding your channel and reading uh, Father Josiah Trim's Rock and Sand. Cool. Um, um, but I'm, I no longer consider myself Protestant. Okay. I'm just trying to decide, trying to decide which church to become, to pursue be, becoming a, a catechumen in. Mm -hmm. But I'm trying to wrap my, my head around penal substitution and the orthodox position on that. Um, I've seen, uh, it, it seems to be that, well, what's your stance on that? 
Uh, did you watch the Cobain video that I'm not being mean, but that we've shared probably a hundred sure. times? Hey, I'm new. No, that's, yeah, that was my sort of, I was kind of joking earlier when I sh- I did the super chat. That's like, where do I start with all your, you got so many videos. No, no, so no, 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 that's I'm not like, my video. Oh. That's, that's Cobain's video. Oh, okay. D- have you seen that? Cobain? Like Kurt Cobain? No. No, I, I have not seen that, man. So we uh, did a whole hour, two, or two two plus hour interview last night with him, and oh, it was last night. Okay. No, we didn't talk about this last night. I'll put it in the Discord. What we talked about last night, we did touch on this a little bit, but uh, there's his video on penal substitution. Um, when you go to uh, John Damascus book three, if you scroll all the way down to the last four paragraphs. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude to you, but like literally we've covered this probably 50 times. So I'm just going to tell you to watch the Cobain video. And then I did uh, a whole lecture series through John Damascus's uh, On the Orthodox Faith. And one whole installment is on this topic. Let me find that one. Okay, man. I'm not trying to be rude. It's just that we, we've, we've literally covered this one probably 100 times. And so... I just, I can't. Hey, like, 101. I'm just, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let me find the one where I cover atonement. Where is that one? <sighs> okay, it's book three. That's book one. Where's book three? Like, so if you go to my page, right? On the front page, if you scroll down, at the bottom, there's the traditional philosophy and metaphysics episodes, right? And the first one is uh, just metaphysics and philosophy. Then it's numbers. Then it's uh, absolute divine simplicity. Then it's uh, Aristotle. Uh, here it is. Jesus's atonement. Here's uh, two and a half hours on it right here. Uh, not trying to be rude. Thank you, J. J. Deal the real. I appreciate uh, your super chats. Enjoyed your support last night. But uh, so there's the. If you're looking on the YouTube chat, there's the two links of two videos that cover that topic. So anybody else? Uh, question. Sure. Um, what do you make of uh, the involvement of most of the hierarchy in the World Council of Churches? Well, there's different levels of involvement. Uh, there's different types of involvement. So I wouldn't say that being invited to meetings or doing these types of things, we're inviting those people to our churches. I mean, if you look at the history of the church, we don't have any problem with people coming to our services. If you go to Moscow, you'll notice uh, cardinals sometimes attend uh, you know, the, the uh, Orthodox uh, Easter services in Moscow. So they can come to our services, but when we're going and praying with them in those kinds of ecumenical services, that's what's forbidden in the canons. So we're not supposed to be doing those kinds of actions, and they should be uh, dealt with when that occurs. But I don't think that um, there's it's some sort of like blanket thing of like, oh, uh, anyone who has any connection to world orthodoxy has now lost grace. That always leads to those uh, different little schismatic groups. And most of the people who go into those schismatic groups end up apostatizing within a year anyway. So you can see the fruits of all that stuff. Even so, the constitution of the World Council of Churches seems to be a violation of the Nicene and uh, Constantinopolitan Creed. With its uh, yeah, but again, what so so attending? Won. So it depends on what it means to be a member. Like, are you attending that thing and are you supporting it, or are you invited to meetings, to conferences? Uh, I mean, if I was invited to a conference and there's Protestants there, you know, it, it's not inherently wrong to do that. Uh, Father Deacon, are you there still? Would you want to speak to this? Because I know you've been to um, things like IOTA. There were probably scholars from other traditions at IOTA. Uh, do you want to speak to that? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, let's just... Let's, this came up uh, the other day about like, kind of ecumenism. So there's incorrect, bad ecumenism. And then... Uh, good at humans. So <clears throat> the canons say you're not to join in prayer um, with schismatics and heretics and things like that. So now we've got to be clear well, what does that mean? So
so typically people will see like at an event like people of different faiths and they'll see a hierarchy like oh Caesar are humanists well, well um, you have to be a bit more nuanced about that like what is the the event what's the purpose of the event um, so suppose it was something on uh, I don't know let's say uh, the persecution of Christians by the state or something in some country and different speakers came for that event or as Jay pointed out it was some type of philosophy event or uh, some other topic in which case there were various religious leaders and each offered a prayer that would not constitute as joining in prayer hmm. um, however if the event was um, unity of faith or something like that and you're joining in prayer, that's bad. Do you, see, do you see the kind of difference there? So you've got to... Also, I would say, and the, does the person, the said person in question or the jurisdiction have a problem with uh, problematic history with bad humanism? That'll shed light too. So you just have to be a bit nuanced about it. Like, what is the purpose of the event? Um, simply, you know, praying in an event um you know, I mean, what if you were at, like, let's say a political, uh, you know, you're you're invited by the president or something like that, and you do a prayer as a higher. That's not participating with, if there were other I got invited to an event. I, yeah, I got invited, yeah. To, invited to an event maybe a few months ago, and there was a lot of Catholics present, and somebody asked me to lead a prayer, right? So I don't think that was, like, some ecumenical violation. Yeah. I mean, that's... No, it's so not, so yeah. leading, leading a prayer is okay, right, according to the canons. The yeah, canons are talking prayer. about you don't join in, yeah, a you can't the canons together. say you can't go to heterodox worship services. So they're talking about going into their churches, tithing to them, doing the Eucharist with them. You're not supposed to do that. Right. Yeah. Now, if these people do that, that is wrong. And by the way, I am not a fan of the World Council churches. I don't think the Orthodox Church yeah, should I, be involved in that. I figured you weren't. I figured you were not. <clears throat> and I'm I'm happy that uh, the Georgians and the Bulgarians recently left it. Right. Yep. I hope that the rest of the hierarchy does as well. Yeah, I mean, ecumenism is the pan heresy. It's a huge problem. In fact, I was thinking about doing a stream on just ecumenism in the next few days. I don't know. I think it's apropos because um, right. Father Peter Hears is talking about the renovationists and the new martyrs, and he's also addressing. Um, what he calls the extreme right solution to the problem, right? Yeah, the the, um, true, the so-called true orthodox, which are just schismatics. They're just they're like uh, the set of a contest version of orthodoxy. And again, we've w this is not new. I've been aware of this group, these groups, for 10, 11 right. years. I've watched people go into those groups, and literally, they come out within a year or or six months as not even being Christian anymore. We've seen people, probably five people, leave our server. To go to those groups and i don't think any of them are christian anymore so good luck with that and by the way those groups are used by intelligence agencies as well just as much as the ecumenists are and uh, naive uh, unsuspecting unsophisticated people you know don't know that and then they go learn the hard way and then they go off and they leave christianity altogether so it's unfortunate but that's what happens now this this leads to my mind the topic of seraphim rose himself so like during the the tragedy of you know communism uh, patriarch Tikon had to release the church abroad and seraphim rose actually entered into the church abroad and like he does talk about the ecclesiastical problems um i guess i shouldn't ask a hypothetical so i, I if, you, if you're talking about is about, are you talking about all this so like the the surgery is we, i already did a whole thing with metropolitan jonah he has a whole history on this i would agree with his position so if you're talking about the rocor like the tiny little schism of rocor that didn't accept reunion with moscow is that what you're getting to yeah i guess like if he had lived long enough where no. i mean it's it's by the way That's they were silly. uh they were in communion with the the serbian patriarch recognized them yeah. the whole time so, so all of these arguments by these these silly were the, were they Weren't they also in communion with Jerusalem at the time as well? Uh, they might have been actually. I'd have to double check, but the... because because I understand like this is this is a very nuanced issue. Like it was it was 
caused by a very severe political crisis, the revolution. And there's have, have you of, heard the interview that I did with Metropolitan Journal on this topic? I actually have. I, I guess I should review okay. that. <clears throat> I mean, you're, you're free to speak. I don't. I'm not trying to cut you off. It's just I don't know what. Oh, go ahead. I had another I had another question. Uh, this book is out of print. Um, it was written by Seraphim Rose. It's a life of John the Wonder Worker. Do you happen to know about this book? I do not. Oh, that's too bad. I'm trying to find a copy of it. Uh, Father V, did you Father V, did you want to say something? Is it, I was just going to say it's not the it's not so much the nature of each particular meeting um, that I think the original point was about, but what the constitution of that organization says. Yeah, like the the third article is it clearly indicates that the World Council of Churches believes that the unity of the church is something in the future that has to be strived right. for, right? A Eucharistic and worshipful unity, and I. It's it's not. Is it plausible to be part of the World Council of Churches without agreeing to this constitution? No, that's a great question. I would say I don't see how you could be consistently doing that, and that's yeah, that's precisely why uh, no one should be. But um, I don't know that I'm not going to like jump on the bandwagon of saying. Therefore, I'm, I'm not saying you're doing this, but this is what the this, the TO schismatics do is they'll say, "Oh, look, here's a thing." Uh, therefore, no grace, right? And this is just obviously just leads to you know schism. And I imagine they they sort of hold their nose and accept the constitution without really agreeing to it, and because they just want the they just want the opportunities for recognition and contact and and sort of to be relevant. And so I don't think you can automatically say that being a member of the World Council of Churches means that you actually hold those ecclesiastical ecclesiological um, presuppositions. But obviously, it's a problem. Right. In reading about the, the history of the involvement with the World Council of Churches, I know that there are a lot of economic and political pressures and, you know, carrots and sticks that are held over these uh, churches. Right. Like, uh, they'll be told, if you leave us, you won't have access to these. Yeah, these it's, 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 a it's a geopolitical subversion this tool. Money, this, yeah. this resort, right. Um, and I suppose this is similar to what ha was happening with... Uh, the council of the so-called council of Florence, right? Um, yeah, and other that's a good analogy. Other attempts at union, right? Um, yeah, I think I think Florence is a great analogy. Yeah, and and uh, a lot of people have been making the connection, the correct connection between as as well as we've done this on multiple streams. I think Father Hears has as well. The connection between today's false union and Florence. There's, there's a, a striking parallels. Absolutely. And keep in mind, it's not all, uh, it's not a, a, a largely a theological battle. This will probably shock many people, but no, this is a geopolitical tool that has huge amounts of money behind it. Look at who's put money into the, uh, the, the seminaries. Look at who's put money into the, the, the promotion of these things at Fordham. It's literally uh, millionaires, billionaires. It's all covered in the Wim Hof book. It's an 800 page book, how it's done in the Roman Catholic church. It's done the exact same way in the Orthodox world as it is in the Protestant world. The moneyed interests are not going to operate in a different way. They're going to, they're going to do things the exact same way. And they just buy off seminaries. They just buy off. Oh, we'll give you $10 million, but you got to install this guy as the head of whatever. Right. And then, oh, now your, your seminary is teaching, uh, you know, uh, Skittles. Right. So it's not even a mystery. It's all in the open how this, this goes down. It shouldn't even be surprising. Uh, but if you talk about it, oh, you're a conspiracy. Oh, you're crazy. Even though it's all public, oh, you're crazy. Uh, does the World Council of Churches emanate from uh, H.G. Wells' thinking, his works? I uh, don't know. It, it emanates don't know. from the Rockefellers. We know where they, they put, they're the ones that uh, put, it's, there's a whole chapter in the Rockefeller's biography on the creation of the world, National Council of Church in the World. I've covered this for 10 years. Not surprisingly, I was actually reviewing the 1983 General Assembly, the highlights of it, and one of the messages that was actually put in in no uncertain terms was we need to have a new economic and political world order sure. to deal with the problems. It's plastic, but it's rubber, like floppy rubber. You just put it in there and then it pulls up. Okay, Dick, bro. That, that's we not we, me. That's we not hear me. you talking about rubbers. 
anyway, uh, we've been going for a while. Uh, I've got, remember, <laughs> we've got tonight's edgy stream over on Rockfin, exclusive to Rockfin. If you're not on Rockfin, remember, it's the best free speech platform. Uh, we know that eventually we will be only on those kinds of platforms because it's just a matter of time before everybody gets uh, incinerated, doused with uh, the napalm of deplatforming. And so come on over there to The Rock. Tonight we'll be covering the UK uh, Ministry of Defense teamed up with the German Ministry of Defense paper on human augmentation. Yes, it's real. It's all out. It's public. I'll show you all that on The Rock Fin. I uh, hope you guys watched the the uh, huge, I think we had two two big streams this last week over on the Halix J-O-N-E-S show. I covered the uh, R-O-F-T-H Childs, right? Uh, in one, it's I think that's had almost 100,000 views from two days ago. Please go watch that. Free World News D-O-T TV. You can watch my... And we covered uh, Alien Agenda. We covered that. I forget. Oh, yeah, we had a Tristana. We had the beautiful Tristana on the H-A-L-E-X-J-O-N-E-S show. Go watch those if you didn't. And uh, give, a, give a shout out, Jay, to your speaking of that. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Just kidding. We will be doing an event. Uh, I think I shared that if you scroll down on the community tab here on YouTube, uh, Father Deacon will be there, Michael Whitcoff, David Patrick Harry, uh, perhaps some other speakers. I don't remember who all he's uh, lining up. Did you get more people or what's the status of that? Yeah, some secret. Uh-oh, we got secret society members showing up. Secret, secret. celebrities. <laughs> secret e-celebs are going to be yes. showing up. It's called Montanica. Go to the community tab, scroll down. Let me see. Actually, I think I can. How many uh, uh, open seats are there, Father Deacon? Oh, it's filling up. So we might have uh, 10, 10, 15. Okay, so if you guys do want to. So here's the link to. Montanica in the, the chat there. Uh, Thursday, July 29th, 17 days from now. Answering challenges to uh, modern challenges to orthodoxy. So me, Father Deacon, Michael Whitcoff, David Patrick Harry, we will be covering all of the types of things that you uh, expect and more. So I'll be covering, I think, uh, the notion of divine simplicity how it plays out in Islam, how it plays out in Roman Catholicism, how it plays out in world religions, and how the Trinity is kind of a unique uh, response to that world religion's uh, uh, assumption. So that will be what I'm going to be covering there from an apologetic perspective. I'm sure Father Deacon... I'll be answering... I'll be... Um, you'll be answering the phone. You'll be, you'll be answering the phone. We got you on phone detail. Oh, that would be great, actually. We're going to have you doing the cold calls. Cold calls, yeah. Um, how to refute and answer your normie doc's friends. <laughs> right? Father Deacon will be doing, <laughs> Father Deacon will be doing the top 10 Orthodox insults. Uh, that will be his, uh, his speech. Like how to, how to counter the best, uh, insults against us. That'd be a good way to do it. How, how to insult people and still seem spiritual. <laughs> how to, how to, one, how to, how to best, one. yeah, how to, how to best <laughs> spiritually. Still piety signaling. Yeah. How to best piety yes. signal. Yeah. That's a good one. All right. Thank you, guys. We had a, we had a wild, uh, entertaining day today. Thank you to our unruly guests who we did give the floor to, our uh, Protestant uh, buddies who called us dogs, <laughs> and our, our uh, Islamic interlocutor. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Be sure to like and share. Thank you for those super chats. Do we have one more? Yeah, we got one more super chat here I forgot to get to. Uh, actually, there's two more. No, one more. Uh, Annex for $3. Jay, I've watched your video on iconography. Uh, your Old Testament examples like bowing before the ark was because the presence of God was there. Uh, yeah, dude. The presence of God is in the Orthodox liturgy. That's the point. The presence of God is present energetically in the icons. So your uh, Protestant argument against us, right? I've got friends, you said, I've got friends who bow down before the pictures of dead Russian saints. The saints are not dead. They are alive to God. Have you read the apocalypse? Where in chapters four and five, it talks about the saints under the altar, praying, offering the incense, which is the prayers of the saints on earth. So we're not praying to dead people. They're alive to God. So again, just simple Protestant misunderstandings. All right. Hope you guys have a good uh, Sunday. Come on over to Rockfin tonight.